hey, looks like it's nine o'clock if we want to yes. get things started. Absolutely. Well, good morning, everyone. We're going to let people continue to sort of log on here, but we are going to honor your time this morning, and we will go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Heather Went, and I am the Heritage Garden Program Coordinator. Um, and uh, the Heritage Garden Program, if you're not familiar with it, uh, it's a program that's being sponsored uh, by your local conservation districts in Benton, Franklin, and Yakima counties. Um, it was created by the Benton Conservation District in partnership with the Columbia Basin Chapter of the Washington Native Plan to promote a low water use native plant landscaping. Heritage Gardens are funded by a variety of sources, but I do want to give a, a shout out, if you will, uh, to our Yakima County sponsors. In uh, Yakima County, Heritage Gardens are funded by a grant from the Washington State Department of Ecology through the Yakima Basin Integrated Plan, uh, the municipal subgroup. Um, and so we are very, very appreciative for their support to provide Yakima County with the Heritage Garden Program. And today, I am joined by the wonderful Alyssa Carlson with the Washington State Conservation Commission. Uh, Alyssa, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah. Um, so I am the South Central Regional Manager for the Washington State Conservation Commission. We're a small agency and we provide support and guidance to all of Washington's 45 conservation districts. And I have the privilege of working in the South Central area. I'm worked, I'm based out of Ellensburg. I get to work with Heather a lot and I'm just um, very honored and happy to be here helping to host this webinar this morning. Um, I'm a wannabe plant nerd. I used to work at a conservation district up in Okanagan, um, and I have a degree in landscape architecture, so I'm just very, very excited to be here. This is like brain candy for me. So just to talk today. Um, I'm going to go through some of the logistics here just for participating in the webinar. Um, you are all, all the participants are muted. Um, so in order to ask questions, um, and you can do this at any point during the presentation, um, you're going to enter them, type them into a questions box. And the questions box is located in a menu, a panel that you can see on your screen. It's probably off to the side of your screen. Um, and there's a heading called questions with a dark gray uh, background. And if the arrow is not pointing down, go ahead and click that arrow so it's pointing down and you'll see a box um, with a prompt to enter your questions there. Issues um, with any of the audio that sounds warbly or garbly or anything like that, um, it's sometimes best to call, call in with your telephone. Um, and we have the phone number up here on the screen. Um, that phone number is also available in that same menu with the questions box where you'll see an audio heading and a down arrow or a little arrow, click it down, and you'll see the phone number and the access code there. And that's all you will need to be able to hear our wonderful presenters today. Um, don't worry too much about the audio pin uh, because we'll, we won't be unmuting anyone. We'll just be monitoring the questions in that technical difficulties at all. Um, go ahead and enter um, that into the questions box and we'll try to help you out the best we can. Um, yeah, and I think that's it if you want to take it from there, Heather. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Alyssa. And I, and I do want to say the go-to meeting software that we're using for this webinar is um, you know, Alyssa's organization, the Washington State Conservation Commission. Our partners are actually uh, allowing us to use their webinar software. So we really do appreciate Alyssa's time this morning and uh, the use of that software. We're also joined on the phone by the phenomenal Ann Autry and uh, covers Heritage Gardens. Good morning, everyone. So glad everyone is uh, able to join us this morning for the Heritage Garden Fall webinar 2020. So uh, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yes, and Ann covers Yakima County for Heritage Gardens, and she does a phenomenal, phenomenal job. Uh, we could not cover Yakima County without Ann. So we are just <laughs> very grateful for, for her yeah. time. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah. Yes, 
It is. Um, so Anne, I'm going to let you introduce our first speaker. Okay, be glad to. Uh, well, today we have three speakers to give you information on topics ranging in landscape design. Uh, today we're going to start with Rick Thompson. Uh, Rick is an author. He's, uh, his book is Giga Flood, the largest of the Lake Missoula floods in Northwest Oregon and Southwest Washington. And he is co-author of The Hunt for Iceberg Erratics. Uh, Rick is a self-taught geologist, and he is also the president of the Lower Columbia chapter of the Ice Age Floods Institute. Um, he has been studying glacial erratics and land formations for over 20 years. Today, Rick is going to present the Lake Missoula flood in your entire Lake Missoula floods path and highlight some of the effects still seen today in central and southeastern Washington. So welcome to you, uh, Rick, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, and uh, thank you to the Heritage Garden for inviting me this morning. Um, now, is Walt Allen there? Uh, I wanted to put a shout out to him because uh, I guess he went to extraordinary efforts to, to get on the uh, uh, webinar this morning. So, hello, Walt. I okay, don't if see we're going to talk. So, if he was not able to get on, that's okay. He'll, he'll get your message. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> and thank you, everyone. This is a, a real pleasure for Hmm. My screen. For the webinar, you have entered as an attendee in listen-only mode. Okay, can everyone hear? If yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay, if we're going to talk about the Ice Age floods, we need to first talk about what's what was underneath, what the, the basic uh, ground level is. So this is a topographic map. No, my screen quit working. Oh, here we go. Okay, this is the Columbia Plateau. This is what they call the Columbia River Basalt Group. These, this is a, a whole area laid down with uh, lava, basalt, 200,000 square miles, up to 10,000 feet deep. So this is a, a very unusual area. These basalt layers are laid down like pancakes. Here's how they were uh, brought out to the Earth's surface. Uh, Columbia Plateau. And over on the right, you'll see a couple uh, columns. Those are what's left of feeder dikes. This lava is thin. It's not like the lava that comes out of a normal volcano. It's thin like syrup, and it comes out of cracks in the ground. Once it's cooled, those cracks will, uh, everything around the crack will erode, leaving what looks like these uh, dikes or walls or, or pinnacles. But this lava was so thin and very hot, it flowed all the way to the coast. And each flow lasted about a week, maybe a little bit more, and then it hardened, and then a area and would flow on top. It's so heavy that the area where it's flowing will actually become Press depressed. And it's heavy. So as, as the lava is flowing, it actually depresses. So most of this is below sea level, but we do have it on the surface. That is what our bedrock is. It's laid down in pancakes, or like pancakes, one right after the other. Now, sometimes the way it cools is into columns. The reason this happens is because basalt expands when it's hot, and then as it cools, it shrinks. And as it shrinks, the whole uh, 200,000 square miles can't shrink as a body. So it shrinks into smaller little sections 
that often look like columns. These are the largest columns that we know of. This is at Frenchman Cooley. These are about 85 feet high, and it has become a very popular rock climbing place. Now, this is an area that shows three different kinds of cooling. It's all the same flow, but it's it cooled in different ways. The, the top area forms what geology Then below that is the columns or the colonnade, and below that is pillow lava. Pillow lava is like you might have seen a video of the volcanoes in Hawaii where it flows underwater. As soon as the lava bursts out underwater, it starts to cool on the outside and forms a pillow. Then it bursts out somewhere else and forms another pillow. This is the typical and um, the anatomy of a typical basalt flow. On the very top, you have uh, the frothy area where all the bubbles have risen to the top. Then when it cools, it becomes vesicular lava. Below that, it cools into random blocks going every which way, and they sort of interlock, so they become uh, very uh, stable. Below that is the columns. Uh, columns are, are prettier to look at, but they're easily eroded because of the large cracks in between the different columns. And then on the bottom, we have the pillow lava, and around the pillow lava is a glassy material that forms when lava hits water that we call pelagonite. Now, the way these lava flows got their name is it's taken after uh, ancient architecture where you had a colonnade. That, so we call the, the area on top where the crystals go every which way, the entablature, and then the columns down below we call the colonnade. This is the uh, Yakima fold belt. Now, I, I describe this as um, maybe someone like Paul Bunyan was walking along and he slipped on the carpet and wrinkled the whole area. So the uh, Yakima fold belt was formed somehow by a movement that actually scrunched up these basalt layers into wrinkles or folds. So laying on the ground, then pressure is applied probably from tectonics underneath that starts folding the lava. Then if it, the pressure keeps going, it folds, it kind of breaks at the top, and sometimes we have a thrust belt earthquake fault that uh, where it actually breaks the ground and looks kind of like this. Now, if you live in between these folds, you probably have wonderful soil. If you live on them, especially on the side that's broken, you will have real rocky soil. Now, I want to show you these uh, some of these folds. We have the Frenchman Hills fold, uh, which we just call a ridge. So we've got the Saddle Mountains Ridge. We've got the Umthanum Ridge, the Yakima Ridge, the Rattlesnake Hills, the Ottenham Ridge, the Toppenish Ridge and the Horse Heaven Hills. So these aren't all of the ridges, but the, it's the these are the larger ones. Now there's an interesting thing that happens with these ridges, in that sometimes a river will cut through the ridge, and it, they, the river could have gone around, but it, for some reason it decided to cut right through. So a water gap is when a stream cuts sideways through a hill or a, a mountain range, or in this case, a ridge. And it could have gone around, but instead it cuts through. So we've got these water gaps in this area. There's one, there's three right there. Then this is Sentinel Gap, probably the largest in the area. Then uh, more down here. And then the, the largest of all is the Wallula Gap, where the Columbia River flows through into uh, the Columbia Gorge between Oregon and Washington. So here is Sentinel Gap. Now you don't 
its gap. The river is tiny compared to the gap. This is Wallula Gap, and it's probably the largest in the area. And I'll, I'll show you a little more of it later. You're probably very familiar with Yakima Gap and with Union Gap. Now there's a new, oh, this is from space. Uh, we can actually look at it from, from the Google Earth and see there's Yakima Gap, there's Union Gap. Now there's a new way of um, mapping things now. This is called LIDAR. And what it does, it uses laser and infrared and visible light and is the data is collected in an air. Then they put it all in a computer and create a, an image from the data that it's collected. And then they can dial out. Uh, they can take the trees out so you can see the earth. Or you, can, uh, you can't take freeways out because they actually have uh, affected the shape of the ground. So this, uh, someone called LIDAR, the uh, crack cocaine for geologists it shows things so clearly. Now, I wanted to point out, this is the uh, Union Gap, and I want to point out the edges of the gap, which you can see when you're driving through it. These sharp edges indicate that it's actually, if it were older, it would have softer, rounded uh, corners like the rest of the the ridge, but instead the gap is sharp. So it's one of the later things that has happened in this area. So now we've got the stage set. Oh, and there is one other thing. On top of all this lava, there was a soil. Well, that was laid down and it was fairly even over the whole uh, area. Now, to understand that, so here's a globe, we're looking down on it. 30% of the land was covered with ice during the last ice age. Now, only about 10% is covered. Here is a circle showing sort of the extent of the ice. This is how far the ice moved. And I wanted to point out something interesting. Right there is the North Pole. Now, does this strike anyone as unusual? It did for me because I expected the Ice Age to be centered around the North Pole. Instead, the Ice Age is actually centered around the land mass at the North Pole and not over the pole itself, which stayed there, but it was, warm, fairly warm water until towards the end of the Ice Age. So what is needed for an Ice Age? We now have about 60 different theories as to why we have Ice Ages, but uh, let's not talk about the theory, but talk about what is needed. We need warm oceans. We'll talk about why. We need cold continents, and we need dust in the atmosphere. So what circumstances can provide these? Underwater volcanoes can heat the oceans. There are over 2,000 in the Pacific alone. Raise the heat of the water enough to cause massive evaporation. It actually lowered the sea level worldwide 200 to 400 feet. That's a lot of water evaporating from the ocean. And then where did it go? It went over the continents where the air was cooler, and especially when it was cooled by land volcanoes putting dust in the atmosphere. Dust did two things. It reflected sunlight back out into space, and it co that cooled the continent. And then it provided dust for cloud condensation nuclei. All snow starts with a little tiny speck of dust that the moisture can uh, accumulate around and turn into a snowflake. Virtually all rain starts out as a snowflake and then melts as it comes down. So we, need, we needed a whole lot of dust in the atmosphere to have an ice age. So what, uh, let's talk about the, how this worked. 
we had we had so much uh, rain and snow falling on the continent that it created a huge ice sheet feet uh, thick. They, some people say three to four miles. Um, I'm not sure how that it was that thick, but it was so heavy from all that water that it actually depressed the earth. And then it started moving. It couldn't just stack up continually. So it actually pressed out on the sides and formed ice lobes. These ice lobes didn't move downhill like a glacier. They moved by the pressure inside the ice cap pushing outward. So let's talk about ice lobes. They are fingers of ice pushed out from the ice cap. They move through internal pressure of the ice uphill and around obstacles. So here's a map of uh, the North American continent and these where the arrows are, are where ice lobes were. These are pushed out from the ice sheet. And I wanna talk about this one right here, that's the Purcell ice lobe, is actually pushed between two mountain ranges in uh, Northern Idaho. As it was pushed through, it blocked the Clark Fork River in Montana. So let's go over here. This is the setting for the Lake Missoula flood. We have the Cordilleran ice sheet. We have the ice lobes, including this one, which is the person over a quarter mile thick of ice. And you can see it blocked the river forming Glacial Lake Missoula. Now it's such an odd looking lake because it wasn't really a lake in the normal sense. It was just filling up the valleys of the Northern Rockies. Well, ice doesn't make a really good dam and every now and then it would break. And when it did, all that water flowed across Eastern Washington, creating the channeled scablands. And then it got down to obstacles like the Wallula Gap right there. That was like a funnel that was too small for the so it backed up. That whole blue area right there is where the water backed up and sat while it tried to work its way through Wallula Gap. Once it got through Wallula Gap, it got down to the Columbia River Gorge, which again was too narrow for the water to get through. So it backed up and created another temporary lake. Then it finally got through the gorge, got down to the Kalama area, and again, it could not go through as fast as it was coming in. So it backed up over 100 miles down to uh, the Eugene area of Oregon, forming what we call Lake Allison. Allison was a geologist. So what were the sculpting tools used by the Lake Missoula flood to change the shape of the land? 540 cubic miles of water. I've been doing this over 20 years and I've been trying to figure how can I envision 540 cubic miles of water? Well, it's about the size of, of half of one of the large Great Lakes or maybe two of the smaller ones, uh, on, uh, Ontario and Erie together. Or, if we had a bathtub that was a mile stretch from this area to San Francisco, that's a lot of water. Then 20 to 40 cubic miles of ice. This was the amount of ice that was in the ice dam. And when it broke, those became millions of icebergs and actually had rocks and dirt in them, so they were very large um, moving battering rams. And then debris. The uh, water was moving so fast, it picked up roughly cu 50 cubic miles of rock and soil from eastern Washington. And muds. As some of it, it presented in the Lake Lewis area, which it was that dark area um, in central Washington. And the rest was brought down into Oregon and eventually out to sea. 
So how does, how does fast moving water do this to the land? Well, there's basically four types of erosion. Abrasion, which is where it's acting as a sandblaster to, to just uh, like you would on, or maybe a pressure washer on the side of your house or something where it just forces things apart. Then an interesting phenomena called tornado. If you saw it from the surface, it would look like a whirlpool, but underneath it is a tornado picking up bedrock and casting it aside the way a regular tornado can do a house or a car. Then there's plucking. That's where the water gets into the crack and just lifts up blocks of rock and casts it aside. And then the most interesting part is called cavitation. This is when fast water moves over an uneven surface. It actually forms a vacuum bubble. Well, when this vacuum bubble bursts or collapses, actually, implodes, it has these, this was first discovered on uh, the ships that have propellers. They couldn't understand why their propellers had these pits in it. So they started researching it and found out it was because of cavitation. As this water is moving, it forms different <coughs> shapes of valleys. A glacier has very slow movement and it makes a U-shaped rounded valley. A normal river or stream moves faster, obviously, than a glacier, and it forms a V-shaped valley. So with the stream down in the bottom. Then very fast. They're box shaped. They have flat bottoms and fairly straight sides. And that's what the Ice Age floods did in eastern Washington. Then there's a fourth valley shape, which can actually start out as either of the three others. It's called an incised valley or an underfit stream. This is when the stream is way smaller than the valley that it sits in. And this is because it had a larger amount of water moving at first, then it dropped down to a much smaller uh, amount that formed the incision in the bottom of the valley. Channeled scablands. When this was first discovered, J. Harlan Bretz, the geologist, uh, talked to the farmers and they said that the land was kind of scabby. They had good soil in some places and no soil in other places. And he noticed that they are in long channels. So here they are visible from space. They're long channels because all the soil and even some of the rock was moved. Okay, um, before I go there, uh, it actually carved away and left some of the soil in hills, but then this is a green, area of agriculture where the soil was deposited. This is Potholes Coulee. This is what first gave J. Harlan Bretz the idea that this had to be a humongous flood. Until he looked at it, they had said this was a glacial uh, feature. And he looked at Potholes Coulee and said, no glacier could ever do that partly because it has dry waterfalls. Here we're looking over the lip of one of the waterfalls. These are plunge pools down below. That's an area where the water hit so hard it actually, the, the lip to fall in and eventually it moved. And you'll see there's two sides to Potholes Coulee. These are like two horseshoes. And uh, you might know that Niagara Falls is the same way. They are in horseshoe shape. We don't know why this happens, but fast moving water will cause a horseshoe shaped uh, escarpment. This is Frenchman Coulee. It again has two uh, horseshoe shaped, one on the right that you don't see and one on the left that you do see. And then in the middle is a ridge. And part of um, here we're standing on that ridge. Here's part of that ridge of 
basalt crystals, one row of basalt crystals, meaning all of the lava, all 85 feet that went all the way across was all washed away except for one row of crystals. Uh, pretty amazing. Now, and they're not crystals, they're just columns. Where, the, where it set down its soil, it was still moving very fast, but not fast enough to erode, so it was started to deposit. So this is West Bar in the Columbia. These are huge, giant current ripples left from the fast-moving water. To give you an idea how big this is, maybe over here, road. That's a tiny, tiny road. I mean, tiny from, from this point of view. <laughs> Moses Cooley is a quintessential flood channel. It has straight sides and a flat bottom, and there's no water moving in it today. There's a little a creek at the north, but it, that, that creek did not form this coulee. 44 miles long, 1.1 mile wide, and 600 feet deep. And you can see very flat bottom, straight sides. In Moses Cooley is uh, the, the nation's first natural, excuse me, national natural landmark. Say that three times fast. No, uh, this is called the Great Gravel Bar of Moses Cooley. 3.2 miles long and 240 feet thick. This is just one huge gravel bar left as the water was slowing down. Grand Cooley is the largest, and here's Eastern Washington again. Here is the area of Grand Coulee, about 60 miles long, up to eight miles wide, and 900 feet deep. Here's a, a close-up map, and we'll show you some of the features. There's the Here's Upper Grand Coulee. Here's Lower Grand Coulee. And what's in the middle is Dry Falls. So that's a, about a 400-foot waterfall, was a waterfall, that means the lower Grand Coulee is about 400 feet lower than upper Grand Coulee. Up at the top of Grand Coulee is where they built Grand Coulee Dam. Now that is the same area where the glacier or ice lobe moved and blocked the Columbia River, forcing it to go down through what is now Grand Coulee. They put a, a dam at both ends of Upper Grand Coulee. This lake for irrigation. So they draw water out of the Columbia River, and put it in Banks Lake for storage, and then take it out from there for irrigation. These are the Sun Lakes. These are plunge pools like that that I showed you at Potholes Coulee that were made as the waterfall receded to where it is now. The way a receding waterfall works, the fast moving water flows over the lip and creates so much turbulence below that it actually eats away the rock and eventually the hard resistant layer at the top falls in. That's why Niagara Falls is where it is now and it's why they turn the water off at night. They actually do so that the, the waterfall won't recede too fast because it brings in a lot of tourist dollars. So they actually stop the water at night and then turn it back on in the morning. Now, Grand Coulee was actually formed by two receding waterfalls. There was a top one that formed upper Grand Coulee and a lower one that formed lower Grand Coulee. Now, we have evidence of the one at Dry Falls, which was the lower one. We don't really have the waterfall itself that as it ate its way backwards, it actually reached the area of the Columbia River and collapsed in. So we don't have the waterfall itself, but we do have evidence that it was there. So Grand Coulee was a double waterfall with the water flowing that way and the falls receding that way. This is Upper Grand Coulee. Now the area of the Columbia River is over on the left, and this 
was a double uh, horseshoe shape, just like the others, but with one on the the this side, and then there was oops, there was another one on the other. The rock is that ridge that was in the middle of the waterfall. So as the waterfall ate away, it left the ridge in the middle. And a steamboat rock is 900 feet high. This is the is Grand Coulee Dam itself. This is where the ice stopped as it moved south. It, it stopped right here, forcing the water to flow over the edge and down to the right. Now you'll see those uh, what I call truncated hills. They're half moon hills, and that half moon was caused by the fast moving water washing away the rest of the hill as it flowed down is uh, probably the number one spot to show the Ice Age floods. This is, for two weeks, this was the largest waterfall in the world. 3.5 miles wide, 400 feet high. It's a, a double horseshoe. There's one on the side we see. And then on the other side, there was another horseshoe. And then over on the right is that ridge in the middle between the horseshoes. So that's Umatilla Rock right in the center. Here we're looking over the lip of Dry Falls and you can see the two U shapes and the ridge down in the middle. Now the water that is now in the plunge pool from Banks Lake. When this was first discovered there wasn't waterfall in those pools. Palouse Falls is now Washington State Waterfall. This is a, it was created by the Ice Age floods. The water flowed over the lip on the left, flowed around the rock in the middle, and then down into the Columbia, uh, into the Snake River. Now, after the, all the flood water was gone, the little Palouse River decided it would flow down through that canyon. It used to go elsewhere, but at the end of the floods, it went down uh, Palouse Canyon. It's definitely an underfit stream. Here we are from the air looking straight down on uh, Palouse Falls. You'll see the land, the river itself takes a zigzag pattern. That's because it's following cracks in the basalt. There was a weak point that the floods were able to take advantage of and pluck out the rocks and leaving a, a sort of a, a zigzag pattern. This is Lower Grand Coulee, I mean Lower Palouse Falls, I'm going too fast. The waterfall is over on the left, you don't see it, but this is the canyon below uh, Palouse Falls. And water was actually higher than the canyon itself. Over here on the left, is the high water line. That's as far as the erosion was able to carve away. Whoops. Over here on the left, you see just a little bit of it. So the actual stream was about three miles wide with the, the canyon in the middle. Now, I told you, J. Harlan Bretz saw this uh, scabby area and the farmers calling it the scablands. So he named it the channeled scablands. And I think this is just a perfect illustration of what a scab land is. It has all these rocky appropriately named. This is a, another area of the scab lands that you can see on the left, I mean, on the right is, is where the, all the soil was removed and some of the basalt was moved. But on the left, you see a, a line and then there's a rounded hill. That's the soil that was there before these floods, and that's the high water line right there. We call it the trim line, and it tells us exactly how deep the water was as it flowed through here. This is another area where we see the high water line cutting the hills. The hills used to continue on down and then leaving these truncated hills. When water is moving fast, it can erode. It picks up all kinds of rock and debris that's in its way. When it slows down, it starts to drop 
the rocks and dirt that it's holding. So here is one of the areas called the Ephrata fan, where it dropped the gravel that it had just plucked out of. In this case, it was dry uh, Grand Coulee. It plucked these huge rocks out and then dropped them. Here's a picture from the air showing miles and miles of rock. And it's up to about a half mile deep in some places. Of This is another one. This is just south of Sentinel Gap. It tore the rocks throughout, through um, Potholes Coulee, Frenchman Coulee, and Sentinel Gap, and then started to slow down, and it dropped all these rocks. As it moved further down, it slowed down a little bit and dropped smaller rocks. Then as it flowed further, it dropped the, the dirt and dust that it was containing. And so then you have the fine soil. So it goes from large rocks to small rocks to sand, then to silt. This is in the Toppenish area, and this is the uh, silt that fills the entire area. So as this very soft, uh, very fertile soil that it has dropped. Here's a close-up of that area. Now it's got some uh, layering in the middle, uh, but they're not they flow in every which way because the water was still moving here. It slowed down, but it was still moving enough to leave layers. So here's a map of the Ice Age floods. On the right, we have uh, Glacial Lake Missoula. Then we have the channeled Scablands. Then, and that's where it eroded. Then the green areas is where it deposited. So when it got stopped behind of feet of that wonderful soil that it had picked up. Then it got through the Columbia River Gorge and dropped another huge amount of soil. And that was actually the, the soil that appealed to the Oregon Trail pioneers. Now I made these different colors. The light green is in Eastern Washington and the dark green is in Oregon. The difference is that Oregon gets a lot more rain. So it actually was more lush even though it had the same soil. The difference was the amount of rain. Here's Wallula Gap. This is what caused all that backup that dropped the soil. And uh, story grain elevator. These sides are over 900 feet high and 1.1 mile long, wide and about eight miles long. So this was the gap that stopped the water long enough that it could drop that soil. This is here, we're looking west across Wallula Gap. Right there is the Twin Sisters. This is an erosional remnant. What that means is that the water washed away all the lava on both sides, leaving this little remnant. This was in a lava layer that had stretched all the way across. So it mile of this lava that it has washed uh, away, leaving the Twin Sisters. Here's a close-up. Now this, it looks like two different lava flows. This is one lava flow. What you see is the two different kinds of cooling, the upper part, the entablature, the lower part, the columns. So what was the Lake Missoula flood like? It wasn't like filling a bathtub. It was the first several miles of it was not water, but a slurry of mud and rock resembling concrete coming out of a cement truck, only at freeway speeds. Now, my video camera was elsewhere. I found something similar. This is a, a flash flood from Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines. This is what they call a liquid solid that can have up to 70% rock and only 30% water. This was caused by the melting of the glaciers on Mount Pinatubo when it erupted. Now it looks like it's flowing like water, but it isn't water. If you stuck your hand in it, you wouldn't have a hand anymore because it's actually rock and sand and volcanic ash moving at very high speed. I've got another video which is similar.
in uh, northern Pakistan a few years ago. And again, it's what they would call a liquid solid. Whoops. Oh, okay. This was caused by that earthquake moving things higher up to lower. I want to point out, whoops, it started over. I can't do that. <laughs> uh, here comes, if you look on the right, you'll see a huge boulder. It's actually a car sized boulder. There you see it just over the. Right, I'm sorry about the video. <laughs> There goes that boulder over the edge. Anything in its way would be totally bowled down. And this is what the first of the Ice Age floods looked like if anybody had seen it. Again, this is a liquid solid, 30% water and 70%. Whoops. Excuse me, I've got to get out of here. Okay, let's go to here. Okay, how do we know that the uh, down in the Columbia River Gorge, this is the, the river flowing through between Oregon and Washington. On both sides of the river, we have huge gravel deposits. These are hundreds of feet thick and hundreds of feet uh, high above the river. This <clears throat> Tumwater Bar on the right is 730 feet above sea level. Well, the river right there is about 100 feet above sea level. So we have a 630 foot gravel moving down the, the what is now the Columbia River. And it would have been all the way across the river. So this would have been more than a mile moving very fast. Now, as the water uh, kept going, it, uh, it left these deposits and as it lowered, it cleared out the water that, or cleared out the rock that was in the river. So these are the clues on both sides. As it came down the Columbia River Gorge, which is now the National Scenic Area, it first hit a volcano that was there that we call Beacon Rock. And all that rock and debris swept away the sides of the volcano, leaving just the core, 850 feet high, and the water overtopped it. Then it hit Crown Point, made a leveled off the top so that we could put a restroom there. As it reached the Portland area, it broke out of the Columbia River Gorge and spread out, forming what we call the Portland Delta, the Portland Fan. So here's the uh, water and rock going through the Portland area. Then it went down into the Willamette Valley, all the way down to Eugene. And again, the larger rocks and dirt are where, at the, uh, where it first broke out of the gorge, and then it gets smaller and smaller. So down at Eugene, we just have good soil that uh, was actually borrowed from Washington and now deposited in Oregon. Only not out the same direction, it continued out to sea. So here it is flowing through Portland, through Vancouver, and then out to sea. Since the sea level was two to 400 feet lower at that time, it moved out 50 to 100 miles from the coast, then was caught by the Japanese current and flowed down to Northern California. So we find a lot of this sediment down off Cape Mendocino in California. Now this is, that's uh, the story of how this soil and rock was, was removed. And if you want more information, the Ice Age Floods Institute was formed to flood and the other Ice Age floods to the public we're always looking for members and we have chapter meetings and field trips where you can actually see the the evidences so uh you can go to iafi.org and become a, jo a member join as a member right now we just produced one brochure for each of the 11 chapters of the ice age floods institute these brochures have 
maps to where you can actually see the features in that area and you can get all 12 i mean all 11 and then the 12th is one that talks about the whole uh, ice age floods national geologic trail this is a trail overseen by the national parks starts in missoula stretches 1300 miles to the uh, oregon washington coast and has 2500 miles of loop and uh, spurs and loop off of the main trail so you could spend a lifetime just following the ice age floods trail and if you want to look at look it up uh, the nationalparkservice.gov and ice age floods and they have a facebook page iafi nps now i've done some th that people like to say well, how can i show my grandkids well this is a dvd that i made from flying over the scablands in eastern washington so we have all that evidence from the air then in the lower columbia area we have seven self-drive field trip guides these tell you how to uh, actually see the evidence as you drive around for yourself tells you where to park what you'll see that sort of thing and this is a uh, a map, I forget the exact size, I mean, not a map, it's a, a poster showing evidences from each state uh, that the flood itself. And on the back, there's a separate sheet that has a map and that shows you where each photo was taken and then a description of why that photo is important. And then finally, all my years of research was put into a book that I call Giga Flood, the largest of the Lake Missoula floods in Northwest Oregon and Southwest Washington. There were lots of books talking about Eastern Washington, but not about the Lower Columbia. So I put this all into one book. Conclusion, the evidence of the Lake Missoula floods is all around us. It has shaped our landscape, our commerce, our recreation, I hope this brief presentation has given you a greater appreciation of the uniqueness of this area where we live, work, and play. Thank you. Wow, that was amazing, Rick. Well, thank Fantastic you. Fantastic presentation. Thank you so much. And I know we have some probably some great questions, Ms. Alyssa. Yes. Um, just a reminder to folks, if you have any questions, please put those in the questions box. Um, just one question so far, um, how far has dry falls receded over the years? About, uh, it's about eight miles, I think, originally. originally. Now, it doesn't, it doesn't recede at all anymore because there's no water falling over the falls. So it was just during this flood, about two weeks, and uh, then the water stopped and the falls stopped right where it was. But it all the way down to Soap Lake. Soap Lake is the first plunge pool that it created as it moved north. I think it's about eight miles, I think. It might be a little further. No, it is a little further. The whole, the whole Grand Coulee is about 60 miles long, upper about 35 miles that it that dry falls receded to the point where it is now. Wow, that's wow. a lot of force. <laughs> yes. Uh, we've got just some comments here. Awesome. Also, wonderful presentation. This is the first time I've understood everything in a geology talk. Good. I try to, uh, my wife says I put the cookies on the lower shelf. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, definitely agree with that comment. This has been a great presentation. Um, summarize it all there. That really drove um, the impact of those homes. Um, another comment that was a great that was great, Rick. Um, I give it a few more seconds here in case anyone has any questions. 
enter those into that questions box. And Rick, I love the website. Um, so you were saying that there were some, uh, and, and Christmas is coming, so I'm asking because I saw some things I think my father-in-law will really enjoy. Oh, uh, so, so all of that can be found on the gigaflood.com website? Institute website, okay. iafi.org. They have a store where they have a lot more things than I do. Uh, okay. But yes, you can find it uh, on both websites. Fantastic. Okay. Great. We've got a few more questions here. Good. All right. What is your favorite local hike or viewing spot? Local? Uh, that's right. uh, down, down in Portland, it, it would be uh, probably uh, Willamette Falls, which was created by these floods. And uh, over the whole uh, path of the floods, it was amazing. Yeah, I mean, it really going is. Along fairly flat ground, and then all of a sudden, a huge hole in the ground. So that would be my favorite. Palouse Great. Falls is Thanks. pretty amazing, too. Yeah, it's hard to pick just one, I'm sure. Yes. <laughs> um, another question here, do you have a map of the extent and thickness of, um, I always get this word wrong, lots or the less of the fine um, soil particles? That's what, when it doesn't specifically show that because they're concerned about the ice age floods but if you look at the area in between the channels you'll see and basically it was that whole area that is the columbia plateau and it was up to 300 feet thick before these floods now there's uh, i think it in in just the areas where the lus is is uh, about 160 feet or so so all the rest was was brought to, over to the Yakima area and then down into eastern Oregon and the Walla Walla Valley where they grow the watermelons and the onions. Lamet Valley and the rest was taken out to sea. So there's there's not even an inch of soil, I think, in the the coolies, but there's up to 160 feet on the hills where it didn't take it away. Great. Wonderful. Thank you. So I think we had one more question from Chandra. How many miles is the Ice Age flood trail total, connecting trail that is, she said? Uh, 1,300 plus 2,500. So, so that's 3,800 miles total. <laughs> and Amazing. some of those are, are loops. There will be a, um, what we call portals where you enter the trail and then hubs where you go there and get directions and can take loops and spurs off in different directions. Like you could go to Dry Falls, they will tell you where you can go and then you can take a, a trip over to uh, Moses Cooley or down to Soap Lake or down to the Afreda Bar and, and then come back to where you started. So that would be a loop trail. This is so new, these brochures that I told you about are just out now. So this is, it's still very new uh, and we're, we're trying to let people know about it. Wonderful, great resource. Thank you, Rick. This was uh, just a wonderful presentation. Well, thank you. I hope it uh, starts the, the day for you talking about uh, your subjects. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Well, thank you, Rick. I think we will uh, go ahead and uh, move on with our next presenter so we can keep on track and on time.
Well, we have Emily Norris as up is our next speaker, and her presentation is titled titled Native Plants for Columbia Basin Pollinators. Emily is an environmental science scientist for the Mission Support Alliance on the Hanford site here north of Richland. Uh, her as an environmental scientist, she's involved with shrub step restoration and pollinator plant relationships. Uh, welcome, Emily. Thank you so much for joining us today for our webinar. Thank you for having me. Um, I really appreciate it. And thank you for everyone who is joining us to listen. My name is Emily. And like Anne said, I'll be talking about native plants for Columbia Basin pollinators. Can you guys hear me? Yes. I just saw it muted really quick. Um, <laughs> no problem. So I have a quick uh, introduction of myself and a picture since you guys can't see my face. That is me. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in ecology and evolutionary biology. And I went to college down in the swamps of Louisiana. So I had a lot of different things I was interested in communities and my first introduction to shrub step into this beautiful environment was when I was working with the Bureau of Land Management in Idaho uh, looking at rare plant populations so I fell in love with the plants here and the dry heat which was a very nice change um, compared to the swamps so from Idaho I moved to eastern Washington in 2016 uh, my mom is from Benton City so it was a really nice return to family here. And I've been working as a environmental scientist um, slash ecologist for the past four years in this area. Native plants um, is in the context of shrub step restoration rather than landscaping. So it's a little different than what uh, the average landowner would be dealing with, but if a plant can survive after being planted in the desert with zero irrigation um, and very little support, it will thrive in your yard. So I'm really excited to share everything um, in this presentation with you guys. And in addition to my job as an ecologist, um, I'm currently pursuing a master's in business administration at WSU with the goal of understanding like a new way of thinking communicate, uh, educate, and help promote the work that we do as scientists to more of the business side of organizations. So that's my little my little bio, my introduction, um, but enough about me. Let's talk about bees. So uh, the data um, behind all of the recommendations in this presentation comes from the Hanford Site Pollinator Study. Uh, this is a study that I conducted from March to October of 2017. And we were looking at what pollinators were abundant on the Hanford site um, and identifying what plants those pollinators were relying on. So we made Columbia Basin specific pollinator friendly seed mixes. And we use those seed mixes um, in habitat restoration on the Hanford site. So, Though it is titled the Hanford Site Pollinator Study, um, and there are many pollinators in the Columbia Basin, bees were the focus of the study as they are the most abundant pollinators and arguably the most important pollinators in our area. So because of that, um, this presentation focuses on bees rather than your butterflies, moths, hummingbirds, and all of the other great pollinators that we have. Um, so in this presentation, like I said, I'll discuss the common pollinators that we find in the Columbia Basin. Um, and then we will discuss pollinator supporting plants and what you and I can do to help support pollinator populations. So before we really jump into this, um, I think it's important to ask the question of why? So why do we need to study pollinators? Why do native pollinators matter? 
and why should a landowner or just a citizen uh, care? So there have been documented declines in pollinator and specifically bee populations. Um, and almost every ecosystem in the globe, and they provide a large amount of the food that we eat. So because of this, uh, most research looks at declining pollinators through the lens of managed pollinators like honeybees. Because honeybees are super important, they help put food on our plates. Um, economically, they're a very important species. But there's also thousands of species of native bees. And native bees have evolved with our native plants, and they play a really important role in plant health and in ecosystem stability. And unfortunately, along with honeybees, um, native bee populations have also been estimated uh, that there's over 4,000 species of native bees in North America alone. And in Washington state, it's estimated we have over 600. Uh, the thought is that we have much more than 600, but like many insects, um, native bees are understudied compared to other animals. So a lot of species remain to be discovered. So what we found is that native habitat restoration has been identified as one of the more effective ways to prevent native bee population declines, which leads us to the question, what do we plant? How do we help restore a bee habitat? And the simple answer is all of the native plants that were originally here because that's the ecosystem that the bees have evolved to survive in. But we have limited resources. Most of us have limited habitat area where we can restore. So that question changes to what plants best support native bees. And there have been relatively few studies looking at pollinators in the Columbia Basin, um, and even less specifically looking at pollinator plant relationships. So this is what initiated the Hanford site pollinator study. We needed to fill that data gap so that we could answer the question of what plants best support native bees. And then we could really target our restoration activity. So as I already have, um, I'm going to say native bees a lot in this presentation. So I'd like to kind of explain what is a native bee. And very simply put, uh, a native bee is a bee that originated in our area and has evolved with the plants that are native to the Columbia Basin. Uh, these pictures show some examples of native bees, and some of them are generalists, which means that they can visit many different plants, um, even non-native plants in some cases, to collect food in the form of pollen and nectar. And some native bees are specialists, so they may rely on a single plant for all of their pollen and nectar needs. So we have a really wide range of lifestyles when you consider that. Additionally, uh, most native bees, with the exception of bumblebees and a few other species, are solitary. So this means that they do not live in colonies like honeybees do. Um, they'll nest in the ground or they'll nest in plant debris or debris piles. And because they don't nest in colonies, um, they're generally very gentle. They do not sting very often. Um, and they're active in the same seasons when you would see like honeybees and other charismatic insects. So that would be from early spring to fall when it's warm outside. So some examples of native bees in our area are shown here. Um, we have the charismatic bumblebee in the middle that most of you probably recognize, very big, fuzzy, and fun bees. Um, on the left, we have a sweat bee, which is a very small ant-sized bee that doesn't really look like what you would think of when you think of a bee. And then on the right over here, we have a orchard bee, which is a very beautiful green to blue metallic um, insect. So as you can see, they range quite dramatically in what they look like. And like I said, in Washington, we have over 600 species of native bees. So there's a huge range of these insects. Um, so I'll be talking more about what kinds of native bees are common in our area later in the presentation, but I wanted to give you just some background and some examples before we get too far into it.
There we go. All right. Um, so for some background information about the Hanford site pollinator study, uh, the data behind all the recommendations in this presentation comes from this study. And the general uh, concept that this study looked at was what pollinators were abundant on the Hanford site, looking at both how many pollinators were there and the diversity of pollinators that were there. And then we wanted to identify what plants those insects were relying on. And again, uh, we used data from this study to formulate Columbia Basin specific pollinator friendly seed mixes. Uh, and the importance of a plant species in supporting pollinators will vary, and that will depend on what time of year it is, uh, which bees it's supporting, and what the surrounding vegetation and its habitat looks like. So because there's so much variation in what makes a specific plant valuable to pollinators, what we identified in the study was a string of similar characteristics in the plants that attracted the most pollinators. And this study collected a very large amount of data um, and it asked a lot of different questions that I would not necessarily go into in this presentation, uh, but I linked the report on this slide and at the end of the presentation if you're interested. Um, so here we'll be focusing on the applicability of this study to our gardens and to our day-to-day -day lives and what we can do. So what kind of bees did we find? Um, we found so many different types of native bee in this study. We collected and identified around 2,000 individual bees, and we identified them to the level of genus, um, which is an evolutionary classification that is one step above the level of species. Um, and in some cases, we identified them to the level of tribe, which is a step above the level of genus. And specifically here, I like to point out that bee identification is extremely challenging. Um, there are very, very small differences between species of bee, some of which require you look at their tongue parts, or some of which require that you look at their toes. And it's these very microscopic differences that make it very challenging to identify bees to the species level. Um, I'm not an entomologist, so we decided that genus level would be the most useful for our study. And using this identification, uh, we found 26 unique groups of bee on the Hanford site. In addition to this, uh, we detected five of the six families of bees found in North America um, on the Hanford site during the study. So when I say a family of bee, that is the evolutionary classification that is a few steps higher than genus. Um, so it'll group together a bunch of genuses that have similar characteristics. And there are six families that exist in North America and finding five of them on the Hanford site was really exciting. Um, so we found a very wide variety of bees and they varied in body size, body shape. They vary in fuzziness, which is a scientific term for how adorable the bee is. Um, and they vary in color. And they also, the bees that we were collecting differed based on what habitat we were in and what season we were collecting them in. So we had a lot of variation um, and a lot of diversity in what we were seeing. So to get into the pictures that we have here, on the upper left, um, this is a bee in the Adrenidae family. As you can see, it might not look like a bee to someone not super familiar with native bees. It looks almost more like a wasp or a strange insect. Um, in the upper middle, we have two bees that are kind of green metallic bees. They're in different families. Uh, the one here on the left is in the Helictidae family, which is the sweat bee family. This, again, might not look like a bee to someone unfamiliar uh, with native bees, but if you look at its legs, you can see a lot of hairs and those hairs are what are used to collect pollen from plants they're called scopa and that is really characteristic of bees and then on the right we have another shiny bee this is a orchard bee in the megachilidae family which is the leaf cutter bee family on the upper right um, we have a fuzzy bee and that is in the apidae family which is the same family where we find honeybees and bumblebees 
So this family has more of the typical bee, the kind of charismatic, big bumbling bees that you would find. Um, here, it's a really good picture of its jaws, uh, also known as its mandibles. So that's pretty neat. It also has beautiful eyes. You see a lot of variation in the eye color of bees, which I'm not completely sure why, but it's interesting. It's very beautiful. On the bottom left, we have a bee in the Apidae family as well, the honeybee and bumblebee family. You can tell it's really fuzzy. It also has very long antenna. So this is called a long-horned bee. They're very beautiful bees and very easy to identify because you have those really long antenna. Right here, we have a bee in the Adrenidae family. I think this looks the least like what you would expect a bee to look like. Um, and this insect is very small. It's about a millimeter long. It is tiny, tiny, tiny. So they're very easy to miss. Um, and you can barely see it in this picture, but it still has those hairs on its legs for collecting pollen. To the right of it, we have a bee in the Coletidae family. Um, these are identifiable with their more heart-shaped faces. And this one has a very distinguished mustache. I think it looks very regal. I love this bee. And then in the bottom right, we have another bee in that honeybee and bumblebee family. You can tell it kind of looks like your characteristic bee. This is a big bee, and you can tell it is just so well adapted to collecting pollen. If you look at its two legs, they're full of pollen. Those pollen collecting hairs are doing their job. So that's just a very small example um, of the native bees that we find in the Columbia Basin in our area and some of the bees that you might find in your backyard. Um, now, the most common native bee that we found was called Lassio glossum. These are also known as sweat bees that you might have heard of, um, and they're very, very small. They're about the size of an ant. You can kind of tell by this picture how small the little bee is. And this made up about 55% of the total bees that we collected during our study. So really, really abundant on the Hanford site. Um, these are ant-sized, and they were commonly seen foraging on small flowers like Cryptantha and Phacelia or scorpion weed species. Um, and these are generalist bees. So they will visit many different types of flowers for food. And they also have a long active season. So we were finding the species from March to October pretty commonly. This graph is from the report um, and it displays the abundance of bees over time collected on the Hanford site, excuse me, organized by family. Um, so each of these lines represents a different family. This blue line represents the Helictidae family, which is the sweat bee family, including that uh, tiny green sweat bee I showed in the previous slide. So you can see that the second most common type of bee, which is this orange line, is the Megachilidae family. And that includes leafcutter bees and mason bees some of which um, include important agricultural species for pollinating. And this graph is showing that the highest amount of bees we collected was in mid-June. So that's when we're seeing really high bee activity. Um, but throughout the entire active season from April to October, we were seeing plenty of bees on the Hanford site. So this graph is important because it shows us that bees are active throughout the spring, the summer, and the early fall. So bees are out and they are looking for food all throughout this time period. Now in our area, in the Columbia Basin, most of our native plants without irrigation bloom in the spring. And there's a lack of blooming plants for bees to visit in the summer and in the fall. So when we're developing seed mixes for pollinator habitat, this is a really important thing to consider. In the spring, bees might really easily be able to find blooming plants to collect pollen and nectar. But as we get into June, July, and all the way through October, those plants become more scarce. So this study covers many other aspects of pollinator life, but let's just get to it. How can we use the results of this study to improve pollinator habitat restoration? There are two things to consider when you're creating a pollinator habitat. Well, there's many more, but there's two important things. Um, using plants that support a wide variety of pollinators 
and providing a mix of plants that together support as many pollinators for as long as possible during the active season. And what this essentially means is when you're creating your pollinator habitat, you want to choose a variety of plants with bloom times that span the entire active season for pollinators. And really in our area, it's important to focus on plants that are blooming in the late summer and the fall, because this is when our native plants are really scarce. There's not a lot blooming at that time. Um, we also found in the study that it was important to provide pollinators with a mix of bloom sizes, so the size of the flower, quite simply. And what we found was that larger body bees, like bumblebees, were visiting larger flowers, as you may expect, and smaller bodied bees were visiting smaller flowers. So it's important to also consider the structure of the flower when you're creating your habitat. And lastly, a really important thing to take away is that we do talk about flowers a lot when we're discussing pollinator habitat, uh, but blooming shrubs are also really important. And when shrubs bloom, they not only provide uh, nectar and pollen, but they also are providing habitat structure within the woody structures of the shrub. So above ground nesting bees that might nest in debris or hollowed out twigs would rely on the woody structure of this plant for a nesting area. In addition, um, some of the native shrubs that we have in this area bloom at an ideal time when pollinators are really looking for food. So you can see in this picture, we have rabbit brush that's in bloom, and then we have a sagebrush sheep moth visiting that rabbit brush. And that rabbit brush is blooming in the early fall, and that's when not a lot of flowers are blooming. So that's uh, providing a very important floral resource for our pollinators. Bitter brush is also an important shrub for our pollinators, as that one blooms um, in like June timeframe, when you might think that a lot of flowers are blooming, but what we find, especially out of the Hanford site, is most flowers have finished blooming by June. So that's actually kind of a scarce time for our pollinators to find food. So it's important to consider that shrubs in your garden are just as important as flowers. So in the Hanford site pollinator study, um, we identified a lot of native plants that were super important in supporting pollinator health. And these plants were that are shown up here uh, were found to be the most beneficial for pollinators on the Hanford site. And they share a really important attribute and that's what I've been repeating, is that they bloom in seasons outside of that big spring bloom. So we have prairie clover on the left-hand side here, and we have one of those green metallic sweat bees visiting it here. You can see that its legs are full of pollen, which is awesome. And what prairie clover does is it blooms up a spike very gradually. So you have an extended bloom time, this flower's in bloom for a lot longer than other flowers out on the Hanford site and in the Columbia Basin. And it'll last through late spring and early summer. So that's a really important plant for pollinators because it's providing those floral resources for a long period of time. Similarly, in the upper middle here, we have pale evening primrose, which is a beautiful plant. And this plant, um, different flowers on an individual plant or variation between individual plants, will result in blooms from the spring all the way into the early fall. So this is providing pollen and nectar for bees throughout almost the entire active season, which is pretty incredible. Um, also important for moths in our area, as are many primroses. And then in the bottom middle, we have Dusty Maiden. Um, and this plant blooms in that June, July time frame out on the Hanford site when a lot of other plants are not blooming. So even though it doesn't have a particularly long bloom time, because it's blooming in the heat of summer, we get a lot of bees visiting it because there's not a lot else for them to go see. And this is one of those long horned bees. If you can see its antenna right here, very beautiful. And then on the right hand side here, um, we have snow buckwheat. And snow buckwheat, in addition to just being an absolutely gorgeous plant, um, it blooms in the early fall, and this is a really important time period, especially for honeybees, um, when bees need to be collecting nutrients so that if they're overwintering, basically like hibernating over the winter, they're well fed. 
they're healthy and they're ready to survive a whole winter. So here we see a honeybee and this plant will bloom typically like late August, September, October, somewhere in that time period and hardly anything else in the Columbia Basin is blooming at that time. So these are really important plants for supporting pollinators right before the winter hits. So we identified many plants in addition to those four that I wanted to highlight. Um, and this table is from the pollinator study. It's in that report. Um, and I thought it was important to point out that we are emphasizing bloom time for every single species so that when you create a mix of plants uh, for a restoration out at Hanford or for your yard here, you can look at when this flower is blooming and you can create a mix of flowers that have bloom times throughout the spring, the summer, and the fall. In addition, um, within the pollinator study, I think it's important to note that we have a lot of native plants on the Hanford site, um, but we are somewhat limited because we have to consider the commercial availability of seed. Um, though we have the option to hand collect seed, we need to prioritize being able to source seed that's available in the market. So that's another thing that we had to consider when we're putting tables like this together is how easy is it for us to actually obtain the seed so that this restoration is realistic. It's something that we can actually do and it's an efficient way to restore the area. So that's another important consideration that we looked at. An interesting observation that we made um, related to plant species was that native bees were visiting weedy species in the late summer months and very, very few native plants were blooming in these areas in the late summer months. But you have these invasive species, these really bad species that we need to eradicate, and native bees are visiting them. So this kind of created an interesting question for us where we have to consider, okay, so we have a native bee visiting a non-native plant right here, is that plant providing all of the nutrients that that native bee needs? Because native bees have evolved with our native plants and they've evolved to survive on the nutrients that our native plants supply. So we don't know that. That's a question we have to ask is, is this invasive plant providing the right nutrients? If it is, if these are generalist bees that can visit a wide variety of plants and they're just fine visiting invasive plants, you have to ask the question if weeds are supporting pollinators, especially during this really rough time for pollinators, should we remove them? And the answer to that, of course, and with invasive species is yes, we have to remove these weeds because they're harming our native environment. Um, however, there are techniques we can use that also protect pollinators. So, for example, you can remove the weeds outside of the active season for bees, so outside of that April to October time frame. Um, prioritize hand pulling over herbicide use. That's really important. Um, you may have heard about colony collapse disorder with honeybees, and though they don't know the exact cause, they believe it's related to insecticide or herbicide use combined with a few other factors. So you have to be very careful when you're using herbicides. And then what's the most important with weed management is when you remove weed species, you have to replace them with native plants. Ideally with native plants that match the bloom times of those invasive weeds, because that's why the pollinators are relying on them, because they're blooming in July and in August when the pollinators can't find any native plants to go visit. So by replacing them with either a long blooming native plant or with a native plant with a similar bloom time, you can help restore that habitat in a way that's not harming bees. Now, in addition to floral resources, bees also need places to nest. Native bees nest underground and in above ground structures, depending on the species. And providing nesting structures to bees is really crucial in helping their survival. Um, there are studies that have shown that nesting habitat is a limiting factor in population sizes of some bee species. So the amount of available nesting habitat is preventing these populations from really growing to what they could be. Luckily, luckily for us, um, it's pretty easy to restore bee nesting habitat. So for below ground nesters, 
you can clear patches of bare ground in areas with sandy, well-drained soils. And ground nesting bees will dig holes essentially into the ground where they will lay their eggs in nest cells. Um, additionally, if you provide woody structures like the shrubs we were discussing um, or debris piles, you're making little crevices and areas for above ground nesting bees to nest. And it is more difficult to create natural nesting habitat for bees that nest above ground. Uh, but luckily, native beekeepers have already pretty much figured it out for us. So bee boxes, which are shown on the right here, are homes for above ground nesting bees like leaf cutter bees or like mason bees. Um, and they're fairly common. And what they do is they provide nesting substrate for these above ground nesting bees. Um, and you can find them online, on Amazon, you can find them at Costco. Um, I believe I've seen some at Home Depot. And most of them will have these bamboo tubes that you can see on the right here. And then they will have drilled holes. And they'll provide that as nesting habitat for bees that would nest in like hollowed out twigs is a good example. As you can see, this bee nest box um, is also providing some debris, like pine cones here, or stacked up blocks here for other bees to nest in. They also have slots for butterflies on this one specifically. Um, and so the Hanford site pollinator study found that leaf cutter bees and mason bees were highly abundant in our area in the Columbia Basin. And both of these types of bees nest in tubes or uh, naturally found in hollowed out twigs or similar structures. And bee boxes are replicating this habitat. So if you get a bee box, which I highly recommend, it's very exciting. Um, you can watch bees build their nests and they'll fly back and forth with their little cut out circles of leaf or with their mud. Um, and you can tell what kind of bee made the nest based on the nesting material. So mud nests, as you see down here on the bottom, are often mason bees, which fill their nest cells with mud to divide them, where nests made of little pieces of leaf, pretty obvious with the name, are made by leaf cutter bees. This is a up close picture of a leaf cutter bee um, showing its mandibles. And these are used for cutting those perfect circles of leaf to build their nests. So if you have broadleafed shrubs or flowers in your backyard and you see little semicircles or circles taken out of the edges of it, that might be leaf cutter bees that are taking little pieces to help build their nest cells. Um, additionally, there's a group of bees that are called cellophane bees and they make their nests out of a clear secretion that kind of looks like plastic wrap. So that's why they're called cellophane bees. Um, I don't have any examples in this picture though. And this photo also is showing an older nest where young bees have emerged from. So when the young emerge, they come out through the front of the nest and some bees will produce multiple generations in a single season. So they might create a nest in May that hatches in July. And then those bees create a nest in October that lasts through the winter. So if you have a bee box, you might find that some of your nests hatch and you're only halfway through summer, and then you'll see another bee, not necessarily the same bee, coming back into that nest cell and building new nests. So that's pretty incredible. And it's a really fun thing to do, especially if you have kids or anyone interested in learning more about insects. Bee nest boxes are fabulous. Um, you typically place them about three feet above the ground and they're not necessarily set and forget. They are low maintenance, but you can't just install it and leave it for years. So in the winter, it's best to place the box somewhere outside, um, but unheated, where it's protected from the wind, rain, and snow, like in a garden shed or under an awning. Um, and it's important to remember that bee boxes, since they host a large number of bees, they're susceptible to mites or to other parasites that might prey on bees. And because of this, you need to replace your bee box either annually. Um, I've read some recommendations that say biannually, or you can buy a bee box with replaceable nest tubes. So you would keep the outside structure of the box and you would buy replacement bamboo tubes. Take out the old ones, put in the new ones. Easy peasy. Um, so I put some guidelines in this slide that help 
explain like best management practices for bee boxes. They are really easy um, and they're really fun, but you just do have to remember to do that annual maintenance so that you're not creating more of a hazard to the bees than helping them. Now, you may be thinking, whoa, 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 whoa. I don't want a bunch of bees in my backyard. I don't want to get stung. I got stung by bees last summer. It was terrible. Well, guess what? Good news. The majority of native bees, since they are solitary nesters, so even though they're nesting in that bee box close to each other, they're independent. They're only in charge of that one nest tube. So because they're solitary nesters, they don't have a large colony to defend like honeybees do. And because of this, they're much less likely to sting. So you don't have to worry about creating like a swarm of bees in your backyard and having the neighbors call the homeowners association or the cops on you because you have created a giant bee colony that is a nuisance. No, no, no. They're so kind, they're very gentle, and they just wanna be your friend. And you just wanna be their friend and it's a great relationship. So very quickly, um, at Hanford, we have implemented a lot of these practices. Um, we have pollinator specific revegetations where we're seeding the pollinator friendly forbs that were recommended in the study. Um, we are monitoring these revegetation, also known as restoration sites for five years. Um, and we're incorporating some pollinator monitoring into that site monitoring. So all of these pictures on the right are from some of our pollinator restoration sites. We have balsam root on the bottom left here that's coming up from seed. We have globe mallow right here, and then a milk fetch species on top here. So that's really exciting, and we're looking at the results of that. Um, we've also installed 20 nest boxes on the Hanford site, and we're looking at a couple different designs to see if one is better at attracting the bees that we have out there. Um, we're mostly looking at nest tube diameter, simply because a lot of the commercially made nest boxes have very wide ranges in how uh, wide the nest tubes are. So we're trying to see if there's a diameter that's ideal for native bees. And we'll also be monitoring those boxes for five years. So how else can you help? You've planted native flowers and shrubs in your yard. Um, you've cleared some soil for ground nesting bees. You've installed a bee box for the leaf cutter and the mason bees. First of all, you're amazing. You're incredible. Um, but what else can you do? Or if you have an apartment and you don't have a lot of land that you can plant native plants on, um, what can you do? And how can you help native bees? From my perspective, I think that education is one of the most important um, things that we have to do in fighting against native bee declines and honeybee declines and pollinator declines in general. So bees still have a very negative stigma. Um, people associate them with wasps, people associate them with yellow jackets, um, or just with the pain of being stung by a wasp or even a honeybee. So I think educationally, simply distinguishing between native bees and wasps has been a really important educational tool that has helped people appreciate bees more. So if you have a neighbor that's like, oh, I have a bee nest in my backyard and it stung me, it was terrible, it stung my dog, you can say, hey, uh, what did it look like? Did, was it fuzzy? Was it hairless? Did it have yellow stripes on its butt? Pretty quickly, um, what I found is you can tease out that it's a wasp nest. And at that point, you can say, oh, that's a wasp nest. And even though I have to caveat with that wasps are pollinators, they do pollinate. Um, it's relatively marginal compared to bees, as bees have many of those specialized pollen collecting hairs, whereas wasps do not. So they're not huge pollinators. They do play a role with that. Um, but it's still important to distinguish oh no, that's not a bee, that's a wasp. And then maybe you could show them this PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> Probably not, but you can give them my email and we can chat. Uh, but it's just good to educate people about the difference between the two and the importance of native bees. There's also a lot of citizen science uh, projects. Now, most of them are concerning bumblebees, still native bees, still great bees. Um, but what Bumblebee Watch and what the Pacific Northwest Bumblebee Atlas is doing is they're looking at bumblebee uh, abundance and distribution 
throughout the United States to try to determine if bumblebee species need to be listed under the Endangered Species Act. So th these are both very important citizen science programs. Um, in addition, the Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation has a board essentially um, summarizing the community science programs that we have in the Pacific Northwest for bees and bee conservation. So if you're interested, that's a great thing to check out. And lastly, um, I just wanted to put some resources up here. If you're interested in learning more, um, I have the link to the Xerces Society website. I think that that is one of the best sources for guides about uh, community science, how to support bees, um, what you can do to put up bee nest boxes or create habitat, things like that. The Xerces Society summarizes it really well. Um, I have linked the Hanford Site Pollinator Study, and I would love if you would go check it out. It's got a lot more detailed information than what we covered in this presentation. Um, I also linked a kind of best management practices fact sheet for nest boxes from the Fish and Wildlife Service down here. So if you're interested in installing a nest box, that's a really good resource on how to install it and what to expect. And then on the right, I have a couple of ID guides. Um, the first one is an online ID guide for bumblebees, and it's really, really interesting. If you have pictures of bumblebees that you want to identify, this ID guide lays it out so simply. It basically just color blocks the bumblebee, and you identify it based on the colors that are present in its stripes. Um, so that's really helpful. And then we have the bees in your backyard. And this book is what I used in the pollinator study. It is extremely user friendly. It is so informative about the different families of bee, the different genuses and species of bee, um, their life cycles, their habitats. It is an amazing book. Speaking of Christmas presents, um, I think this would make a great Christmas present to anyone even kind of interested in learning more about bees. I think it's like $25 on Amazon. Um, but I highly recommend this book. It's very good. And I believe that is everything that I have for you guys today. Um, thank you for the opportunity to share my passion and my knowledge with you guys. And I'm super happy to take any questions that you might have. Emily, that was a beautiful presentation. <laughs> thank you. Couldn't help myself. <laughs> Ms. Alyssa, do we have some questions? Yes, we do. Um, so the first question, ooh, we're getting lots of comments. I've lost, okay, here we go. First question, <laughs> how do you keep hornets out of bee boxes? That's a really good question. Um, so I had a bee box when I lived in an apartment last for the last two years, I had one there. And what I noticed the first year was that the butterfly slot that came with the bee box had a hornet nest in it. And I'm like, oh my God, no, this is not what I wanted. Um, so they weren't predating on the bees in the nest cells. So I let them live out their life cycle. And then the next year covered it with duct tape so that they wouldn't rebuild their nest inside that slot. Um, so what I have found is if you buy a bee box without those gaps where hornets can build their nests or without butterfly slots, um, covering them with duct tape or doing something similar is a good way to prevent them from nesting in your bee box. I've also found um, that a mud dauber created its nest in one of my nest tubes. But in this case, I just let it live out its life cycle. It wasn't really bothering me. So I just said, you know what? It's found a good home. Let's let it move through its life. And uh, it was fine. Everything went well with that. But yeah, I would just recommend covering those larger slots to exclude them. Got it. Great recommendation. OK, we've got a few more questions here. Um, next one is on the pollinator bloom time slide. Is it saying that primrose is spring? I thought it lasted spring through fall. It should be spring through fall. Um, let's go back real quick. Doo, doo, doo. Yep, 
Yeah, so the big X here means that it's main bloom. It's like biggest bloom when you find the highest percentage of flowers on a single plant in bloom was in the spring. And then the little O's uh, mean kind of like a minor bloom, marginally bloom, blooming throughout the summer and the fall. So it does extend that entire time period, which is really important, but it's big pulse of flowering is in the spring. Great, thank you for that. Um, next question is, can I encourage wasps to leave my yard while also inviting native bees to stay? If so, how? That's a really tough question. And <laughs> I, I really wish yeah. I knew the answer to that because I struggle with the same issue. I really do. Um, yeah. I don't think there's a simple solution. It's kind of that like overarching ecosystem management where you have to take the good with the bad, in my opinion. Um, so it really depends on how you want to manage your land and your area. For me, um, typically, unless wasps are nesting like right by my front door or somewhere where the dogs are going to mess with the nest, I just let them be. But it really depends on your preference and what you want. I can't say that I have like a perfect solution for that, unfortunately. Yeah, seems like the million dollar question. Yeah. All right. So next question is, I'm in the Natchez Valley and I put up a bee box in spring. I followed the directions about height and a clay bath down below, but no bees came. Do I have to buy bees? Oh, interesting. Um, um, no, but what I would do is look at the direction, like the cardinal direction that the bee box is facing. Um, a lot of recommendations say that it's best to face it south or southeast, and that is for uh, full sun, essentially, so that the front of it is sunny. I would make sure that it's not shaded um, or in an area that's really obstructed by shrubs or trees or anything like that, like out in the open is a good place to put it. Um, and generally, it, we've had the same problem at the Hanford site where a few of our bee boxes just don't get that many bees. And there's that question of why. That's really hard to answer without a very intense study. Um, I would honestly oh. recommend trying a new spot. And if you can get it in an area that's closer to like your most abundant, flowers and the really prolific natives in your yard or the really prolific yeah. bloomers that's probably the best bet that you have but i would also recommend maybe if you don't have a better spot for it just leaving it up for multiple years um and what i have found and what we've seen is that if a bee box is successful even if you have like one or two nest cells that are filling up the next year more bees will come so it might just take time. That might be the biggest issue. But yeah, I would check to make sure it's uh, facing the right direction, that it's not obstructed or shaded by anything, that it's near most of the blooming plants in your yard. And then if all of that is already perfect, I would just wait, just wait and see. Another issue actually that you might be having is if you look at the like diameter, the tube size, what I have found and I don't have like concrete research to back this up yet. Um, but what I have found is that the bigger tubes attract less bees. That is kind of like incidental observations. Um, but generally the bees in our area are very small. So oh, you really want to find nest boxes that have relatively small openings, like three to five millimeters. And that's what I found to be the most successful. Gotcha. Great tip. Um, and this is a question that maybe some of our panelists can also answer, though. I'm sure you have some great recommendations, um, just inviting in case others have ideas. Um, do you have a list of places where we could pur purchase some of these plants? Oh, I think that Heritage Gardens and the Native Plant Society is your best resource for that. Yeah, so on the Heritage Garden website, if you visit that, hgcd.info, um, we have vendor lists. 
lists where we have all of the regional native plant vendors on one list uh, with their website information and contact information. Um, so that's probably the most holistic resource I'm aware of. And then you can just go and, and uh, see what those different vendors have available. Great, thank you, Heather. We can put that um, link in our, um, out to the audience as well. Um, another, another question here. We've got a few questions about asking if the, this presentation is being recorded and if there's a way that um, they can get the slides um, that reference the website. Um, how will this be shared out? Sure. So we will share uh, the webinar, the recording of the webinar. Uh, you've registered. We have your email address. So we will send a direct link to everyone who is on uh, the webinar today. Um, we'll also share a link on our Facebook page, the Heritage Garden Facebook page. By the way, if you haven't visited um, our Heritage Garden Facebook page, it's a really fun uh, page to visit. We post a lot of interesting things about pollinators and native plants, as well as regional events that you can attend right now virtually. Um, so that's that's the other uh, location to look for that webinar posting. Great. Thank you, Heather. Okay, I think we have some time for some more questions. We have until 11 o'clock. Is that right? That is correct. Okay, Emily, are you ready for some more questions? I am ready. All right. Can you clean out the tubes of a bee box or do you need to throw them away? Great question. Um, you can clean them. There are guides online for how to clean the tubes. Um, in that case, you need to make sure that you purchase a bee box with removable tubes. A lot of them will glue the tubes to the back of the box. So they become, you have to remove the full tube in order to clean it. Um, but once you do remove those tubes, and I don't remember the exact ratio, you know, but there's essentially like a bleach water solution after all the bees have emerged, um, obviously, that you can submerge the tubes in and essentially soak them and use a pipe cleaner to clean them out. So there is, and that is a good sustainable option um, to reuse your tubes. And yeah, there are, so there's guides online. I don't think that this fact sheet that I've linked here specifically talks about cleaning, um, but it's pretty easy to find that information. So it's essentially a bleach soak and a pipe cleaner clean. Great, thank you. Um, just a comment here, um, but Cecilia Hastada, sorry if I pronounced that incorrectly, is it also an important pollinator plant? Yes, absolutely. Great. Do the beneficial plants tolerate a variety of hydration levels, meaning from not getting watered to being irrigated? So I touched on this a little bit at the beginning of the presentation. Um, my knowledge of these plants is really in the context of habitat restoration using zero irrigation. Um, so what we find with those plants that were listed in the recommended species, we're recommending them um, not only because they're really good pollinator species, but they're really good for our style of restoration, which is essentially either direct seeding or planting what we essentially seedlings into a restoration area. Um, so that's a zero water situation. And for each plant, it will vary depending on once you start irrigating, how well they do. Um, I know that certain plants like glow mallow that we recommended does fairly well with irrigation, but I think that that is another really good question for heritage gardens because they have a lot more experience with how native species interact with our like typical landscape irrigations. Sure, and that's and that's one of the things that we provide homeowners is really the range of moisture that those plants can tolerate. And one of the great things about the Heritage Garden Program is if, if you're interested in uh, a native plant garden, you know, we can provide you with that information if you have an area that maybe gets a little bit of overspray based on your soil type and the amount of sun, uh, what plants would do well there. Uh, maybe you have an area um, that gets quite a bit of overspray, uh, you know, so we can definitely uh, create custom plant lists and plant recommendations for you uh, based on the conditions that you have and based on the, the amount of water that you have. So 
So that's something that the program offers as a free service. So just reach out to Anne uh, if you're in Yakima County and myself if you are in Benton or Franklin. Great. Okay, next question. Is the Hanford seed mix available to conservation organizations? That is a great question. So, um, what Hanford uses for our restoration guidance um, is called the Hanford Site Revegetation Manual. And this manual is available to the public. Um, it's online if you just Google Hanford Site Revegetation Manual. And it has been very recently updated uh, by me in the last two months um, to include pollinator focused revegetations. And that is a section in that manual. Um, it is not all inclusive of the species that were listed in the pollinator study. The way that the reveg manual is laid out is it's more soil type by soil type. So that's how we sort through what approach we're going to take to restoration. Um, but, and I do need to double check that the newest revision of that manual is on the website because it did come out fairly recently. Once that's posted, that section on pollinator focused seed mixes will be in the Hanford Site Revegetation Manual. And then you can also look at the Hanford Site Pollinator Study, which is online right now, and that'll have species lists in the best management practices section um, towards the back of the report. Great. Okay. What kind of temperatures can bee mites survive? Oh. That's a very good question. Um, I am not, I'm not totally sure. I don't think I can answer that. That's something that I really want to Google right now. <laughs> but, you know, they're present. <laughs> we did see what was interesting about this study um, is with some of the bees that we collected, we found mites on them in that area uh, between the thorax and the abdomen. And when you're looking at them under a microscope, it's quite freaky and you can really see what a parasite that they are. Um, so they're quite a detriment to bee populations. And I'm kind of assuming that in our area, you know, it gets so hot. I don't think they die off in the summer because um, we were seeing them pretty much throughout the year. So I can say that they can survive through like 100 degree weather just based on my observations, but I'm not sure that max minimum temperature range. Okay. Um, I have a I I have a couple of beehives in my yard, and uh, mites over winter in the in the with honeybees, and so it's a continual problem um, mm -hmm. all year round for with with the varroa mite. So I'm not sure if this you're seeing the same mite out on the Hanford site as we see in with honeybees, but. Uh, uh, varroa mites will will survive in the hive during hibernate when they're hibernating. Uh, the bees typically keep that hive, uh, the honeybee hive, you know, up around 90 degrees during the winter. So um, it's not like it gets frozen in there. So <laughs> they can survive uh, those temperatures uh, during the winter time. And we were we were seeing varroa mites. That is what we saw on our native bees. Um, okay. Yeah, so it's it's quite an issue. And I was talking about herbicides and insecticides earlier um, and colony collapse disorder and varroa mites were believed to be one of the contributing parts of that within honeybee colonies. So that's correct. Are, yeah. Yes, yes, they are quite a problem right now for managed pollinators and becoming a problem for our native pollinators as well. Okay, we have time for one more question unless Heather tells me otherwise. Um, how long do bees typically live? Great question. Um, it depends on the species. So with our native bees, typically they have a year life cycle. Um, so if you start in the spring, they will hatch from their nest cell. Males and females will go out, the males will reproduce with the females. Um, females will collect pollen and drink nectar, and they'll bring that pollen back to their nest cells that they start building. 
Um, and then typically will lay their eggs, create their nest cells, depending on the species. Um, if it has a one-year life cycle, the adult will die off before the winter, and then those eggs will last through the winter as they develop into little baby bees, and then adult bees in the spring will emerge. So that's a one-year life cycle. Um, other bees, like queen bumblebees, will have a multi-year life cycle, um, but typically with our small native bees, you'll see a year. Great. There was one other question that uh, I wanted to make sure we, we got answered, and that really was, is a water source important for native mm -hmm. pollinators? I think that's a really important thing to touch on. That is such a good question. Um, in terms of our, like, our yards and our neighborhoods, I believe that it's adequate water that's present here for our native bees, because what we find out in the desert um, on the Hanford site, we have very, very few water sources, the main source being the Columbia River. And we were find, finding higher quantities of bees closer to the Columbia River. Um, but there was kind of that compounding factor of there being a lot of agriculture on the other side of the river. But essentially, we were finding in the inland desert areas still fairly high quantities of bees that were surviving on what we presume because there was no water within like 3,000 meters was very, very little water. Um, so in terms of your backyard landscaping, it is important to be providing a water source just to like extra, extra make sure that those bees are as healthy as they can possibly be. Um, but in our native ecosystem, the bees that are adapted to live here are pretty used to very low water circumstances. Wonderful, thank you. Emily, that, that was a fantastic presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you guys for having me. I love sharing this. Um, and if you guys have any questions, anyone listening, uh, my email is emilynorris26 at gmail.com and I'd be happy to answer any additional questions you might have. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I think we're going to take a 10 minute break so we can all stand up and stretch. Maybe grab another uh, cup of tea um, or whatever your beverage of choice is. Uh, and then we will be back with the phenomenal Tracy Daggerman. Which card? Oh, whatever okay. you are. Okay. Well, thank you all for your time. And um, Anne, would you like to introduce our next speaker? I would like to. This is uh, our third speaker today is Tracy Diggerman. Uh, she will be presenting My Wildland Inspired Garden Lessons from a Living Experiment. Tracy is a self-employed as an environmental consultant. Her business is Ecosystem Aesthetics LLC located in Richland, Washington. Uh, Tracy has more than 25 years of experience in ecological disciplines such as research, vegetation surveying, ecological restoration and native plant landscaping. So welcome Tracy to our webinar. Thank you so much for uh, coming today or providing this or doing this presentation for us. Uh, we're really looking forward to hearing what, you, what your living experiment is all about. Thank you, I, I appreciate having the opportunity. Um, like she said, my name's Tracy Degerman and uh, what I hope you get out of this, um, this isn't so much a how-to um, presentation, it's more of a what are the possibilities type presentation in terms of native plant landscaping, uh, what you can do in a residential setting. Um, so I, like she said, my background, um, I have a, a bachelor's of science degree in general biological sciences and in uh, that took me through a few years of working as a research technician for Battelle, uh, working as a, a biological science technician for the U.S. Forest Service, um, and, uh, for, and with the uh, restoration crew initially at the uh, Mount Rainier National Park um, with the National Park Service. In 2007, my interest in native plants um, and my desire to uh, use them in, in my landscape uh, led me to, uh, to pursue a master's degree in landscape architecture in uh, at WSU in Pullman and 
Um, and subsequent to that, I started my business and took some clients for a couple years. Um, but I don't think the Tri Cities was quite ready for that uh, that type of landscaping yet. I didn't I didn't uh, wasn't making a living, so I went back to uh, working for the government. And uh, from 2010 to 2019. I worked for the National Park Service at Mount Rainier, and that's where you see me in this picture. Um, but now I'm back here and uh, hoping to get things going again because it seems like there's a growing interest in native plant landscaping. So what I'm going to show you is, um, I hope this doesn't come across as like somebody watching somebody's vacation video, but I'm going to show you how I transformed a modest <laughs> residence in Richland, Washington from your basic lawn landscape into a place that makes me f makes me feel like I'm at home up in the mountains where I would prefer to be. Um, so let's go ahead and dive in. Here's the beginning. This is what I had to work with. My husband and I bought this house in uh, Richland in 2000. Um, and uh, like as you can see, had the basic. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you, if this is uh, if this has a this type of landscaping has a name, but your basic lawn and foundation shrubs. Um, there were no trees on the property. Um, in December of that year, we uh, bought a uh, Scotch pine and planted it. I really wanted to put in a lodgepole pine, but I couldn't find one um, at a nursery nearby uh, that we could afford. Lodgepole pine is a native species um, to eastern Washington. Um, that's the front, so out back, um, lots of space back here. Again, just lawn, um, no, no, no plantings back here. Um, and so I, I viewed it as a blank canvas um, and was excited to start doing things with it, but with a limited budget, um, it was a slow start. So it started in uh, um, July, in the summer of 2000, with just your basic garden elements. I mean, this is kind of what I grew up with. My mom had a vegetable garden, and uh, she had flower beds, and uh, um, you know your basic commercial nursery species. Uh, when I was when I was a kid, gladiolas were my favorite flowers, so I put 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 in gladiolas, um, and so this was kind of how how I. I started just because I hadn't hadn't had any inspiration at this point. I was just going by what I had grown up with. Um, kind of got a little more formal with the beds. Got <laughs> got into uh, really into vegetable gardening, um, and uh, uh, established these beds. Um, used uh, I'm very much into using gleaned materials or or trying to cut corners on cost where I can. So actually, instead of um, using expensive wood around these beds, I actually put an ad in the paper for cinder blocks and ended up getting a bunch of them for free. So that's what uh, was I surrounded these with. I was starting to get more interested in uh, in native plant landscaping. Um, I had by this time I had worked um, a season at or uh, yeah for a season at, at Mount Rainier and I'd also worked um, for for the uh, US Forest Service in the Natchez Ranger District in uh, which on the east slope of the Cascades. And that still remains my my most favorite uh, Eco region is that that east slope uh, shrublands, uh, shrub step grading up into pine and grasslands and into coniferous forest, and so I started bringing some of that that look, not necessarily the species themselves, but the look home. And I had a little corner. This this here is located right up over there, but for the most part, I was still in your your basic residential landscaping. Um, continuing to progress, I put in an herb garden. I started of bordering um, 
my flower beds with local basalt. I just, I love basalt. I would have a house made out of basalt if I could. I just think it's, I just think it's beautiful. Love the color, love the, uh, the, the texture of it. Um, so I started to bring in more elements of the local environment in uh, a few more type, you know, native species. Um, made some mistakes. Uh, this is this is one of the mistakes I've made. Um, was planting a mimosa tree. Um, they are they do well in our climate, almost too well. Um, and and the uh, pollinators love them, um, but they they're a very messy tree and also quite invasive, as I would come to find out. So this is in 2002. Um, and that's kind of how our backyard stayed for a while. That was, that was, we were kind of set with that for several years, but so went out and decided to explore some, uh, uh, putting in more of a native plant landscape in our front yard. Of course, in full public view of people who wondered what the heck we were doing. Uh, felt at times like Richard Dreyfus in, uh, Colts and Cows of the Third Kind, where he's gathering materials to build his uh, mock-up of Devil's Tower in his living room, people would actually stop and, and watch us what we were what we were doing here because they couldn't figure it out. But um, I had a plan in mind, and I actually put this one on paper, but I couldn't find the file to include in this presentation. But basically, I had. Um, I had little uh, little e little ecosystems, little habitat areas. So along the street where it was where it's driest and hottest, I had like local shrub step natives plan to go in. This is actually uh, mock orange. Um, it's a uh, uh, native to the uh, more slope mountain slope areas in eastern Washington in riparian areas, and then I had. Um, thought of putting like a uh, uh, subalpine looking community. I mean, subalpine species wouldn't survive in our area, but I wanted the look of that. And uh, basically the, the stones were placed by the dump truck. Basically I bought, bought some stone and have, had the dump truck back up and just drop them. And that's where they ended up and we designed around them. So um, that's my, my poor husband who has been very supportive throughout all of this. Um, so finished installing that in October 2002, which by the way was very hot. It wasn't like now, it was it was about 80 degrees that year. Um, and the next year uh, we had pretty nice uh, growth on, uh, on, our, on our plants um, and was very pleased with how it came out, although I knew this wouldn't stay this way. And what what I think people might not realize with a native plant landscape is just like in nature, you're going to have succession. The plants aren't going to stay the same size. They're not even necessarily going to stay in the same place. Um, so, and plants when you, you know, when you buy them from the nurseries start out really small and you feel like you need to plan a lot of them to fill in you know the space otherwise it doesn't look like you have anything so my tendency um and and i did this you know for clients too was to plant too many and then see what kind of you know what lived what didn't and uh go on from there so this is in august 2003 by August 2004, I got things filling in nicely. And this is kind of what I wanted. I, I always felt like the house is too close to the street. And uh, I didn't like, I like, I wanted to be able to sit on my front porch and have some privacy. So I planted a nice uh, red osier dogwood and a service berry right in front um, of the uh, house and uh, getting some nice fill in there. Um, so that was the front yard. So that's pretty much how it was for, for years. And uh, it gradually got taller and taller. Um, but then we moved to the backyard. And this was a major undertaking, as you can see. Um, I didn't do a written 
design for you know plan drawing for this it was kind of just um as i went along i had a i had an idea in my head and again i had zones um just habitat areas where um based on microclimate conditions um certain i knew certain things would do well and there were certain places where i would create the conditions for plants that i wanted that not aren't necessarily um, adapted to living in our Columbia Basin area, just because I they're they're from areas where I worked and I I wanted to have them around. I wanted to see them in my yard. So um, took everything that we had had before. So all the cinder blocks um, were uh, used for other purposes, as well as the red gravel that was there. The uh, soil from the raised bed and the uh, the tires that I'd had my uh, squash and melons planted in um, went into this berm, which uh, is about that's just maybe a little over three feet tall um, in the middle of our backyard, and uh, um, got a bunch of uh, rock basalt of different sizes and shapes. Um, a lot of this was gleaned from scree slopes in the region. I drive around the region and and uh, you know, our, our, uh, there are plenty of places to collect rock. I mean, you can't like go get a whole dump truck of it, but um, just, you know, collecting from here and there and uh, filled this in around the edges with, uh, with uh, the basalt. Uh, I did buy some nice larger pieces and I made kind of a ridge crest in the top of this berm here. And uh, I wanted to put, uh, I really hope to be able to grow um, some uh, the ridge top species that I'd seen during surveys in Eastern Washington. Um, they're not easy to find in plant nurseries and I've discovered that some of them are actually pretty difficult to keep alive in a yard. So this is my collection of what I was gonna plant. Uh, a lot of it was from, uh, uh, Plants of the Wild up in Tico near Pullman and others from Derby Canyon natives in Peshastan. Um, but it's probably about $500 worth of plants. Um, here's the other view I did put in. This is not a water feature. It's actually, um, it's actually a wildlife and bird you know bird water source so i knew the plants would grow up around it it wasn't necessarily something that i wanted to be able to see and put uh, koi fish or anything in um, i wanted to have a place where um, birds and uh, insects um, that live in the yard could go and uh, have a water source um, so you could see the stonework that i worked into the sides of the berm here it was a lot of fun to build this i don't think i could do it now physically but it was a lot of fun to do um back here uh, i had uh, a little at what i call my acid garden i had some uh, things that required acid soil um some blueberry bushes huckleberry bushes uh sm small cedar tree some other things that's in the very back uh corner of the yard, which gets uh, shade in the afternoon. Uh, here's another view. I uh, finally got my lodgepole pine, planted it here. Um, got a, a couple of, of vine maples, which don't, they're, they're not, they're not native to our area. And they're actually not even, they're pretty rare to find in the East Cascades. They're more of a West side species. Um, but I just, I, I love them. I they're my favorite. My favorite thing in the fall was going into the lowland forests in uh, Mount Rainier and seeing the vine maples in their scarlet, uh, their scarlet hues. And I wanted I wanted to be able to see that at home. So this area of the berm was going to be my montane forest area, and there would be irrigation there. Um, each of these each of these zones are different irrigate drip irrigation zones too, where I could control the amount of water based on what um, species I was including. So there's a blue elderberry there and the other vine maple there. And this is this is looking at it from down here. 
I wanted to pass to go th around all of it because I wanted to be able to walk out and around and get different vistas, um, just as you would walk, you know, go a hike on a trail in the in the woods and and see things from different angles. I didn't just want to be sitting on the porch looking at it. I don't want to be able to get out into the landscape. Um, finished up the uh, uh, the backyard planted areas, and uh, they were starting to come in and. and decided that I didn't like, I wanted this, I wanted the vegetable areas to be formalized. This is all very naturalistic, um, but I didn't really, it wasn't working for me to have the vegetable garden area in that. So I began the process of putting in raised beds there. And uh, this is the outcome, um, 2011. And uh, you can see the berms nicely filled in. And uh, my pine's already putting on some height and um, already uh, pretty pretty well established. Um, but I knew things were going to get a lot bigger. And uh, once, you know, like I said before, I tend to overplant. I, I plant things, I, I include a lot of species in a small amount of area. I would not necessarily do this. Um, in a designed landscape for a client, um, because some people would could think it would, it ends up looking messy, but I actually I I enjoy the look. Um, so, moving along, succession um, in the backyard landscape, things getting getting taller, filling in more. Um, 2013. Um, Pine's putting on a lot of height. Got my red osier dogwood, got a wax current here. Um, beautiful firecracker penstemon, um, showy penstemon. And uh, this is looking out um, from uh, the back towards the back of the garage towards the middle of the yard. Then up into 2018. Um, this uh this is when I began to really see a lot of um, regeneration of plants in places that I did not plant them. <laughs> um, and that can be a good thing or a bad thing. Um, in this case, it was it was a good thing. I, I did not expect to have needle and thread grass um, growing in this area. Um, but it came in, receded from down here, and I actually liked the look of it, so I kept it. Um, and uh, the uh, globe mallow um, really kind of filled in this area right here that I was trying to keep more in uh, um, lower kind of uh, rock garden type plants. Um, but still, like the look of it. Um, the again more plant movement into places i didn't plant them these i think because of wa rain washing the scattered seeds down the little slope of the berm um these shoy pinstemon just came in like gangbusters right down here along the the rock border and uh, this is the path is down below right here so it wasn't exactly how, how I wanted it. I wanted, you know, you generally want taller species in the back and shorter ones up front. But they're just, they're so be beautiful that I, I kept them there for a couple seasons and, uh, and collected a lot of seed off of them and uh, eventually pulled them out. Um, and made this, finally took down the mimosa tree. Um, there's a stump right there. Um, made this into a little cove area, shady place to sit in the afternoon with my cat and uh, look out over the rest of the yard. And uh, again, that berm, um, just a beautiful, beautiful flowering um, of uh, the May is the most spectacular uh, month of the year in my backyard with the, uh, the cactus and the glow mallow. The parsley right here and the, the uh, buckwheat, um, just love it. And this was the spring, May 2020, um, took out the all but one of the clumps of uh, penstemon, um, 
got things a little bit more tidied up, but I, I kept a few clumps of the, uh, the very abundant needle and thread grass. It adds just a really nice cast over the, uh, the area, especially in the mornings and the evenings. Um, and yeah, just been more views of that, that berm area, which I, um, I just love sitting out and, and looking out at it. It's, it's, um, and, uh, got some, uh, rosy pussy toes here, some Missouri evening primrose. So what I, what I ended up doing here is there are, I'd say, I'd say it's about, probably about 80% Pacific Northwest natives, but I do have a few, uh, plants and just because of their, I, I am glad to see that cultivars of native species are tar starting to turn up in like regular nurseries, like even the Fred Meyer nursery um, had these Missouri evening primroses, and I'm like, yeah, I'm going to support that. Um, so I have a few few Nor North American native species in here. Um, in addition to the uh, Pacific Northwest natives, like these sedum, these sedum were, were, they're not necessarily Northwest native species. Um, they came, actually came in one of those, those square, uh, square foot flats um, full of sedum that you just have to separate and plant and uh, to fill in that, that rocky area. Back out in the front yard, um, really filled in, um, just, Wax currants filled in. Got some buckwheat over here. Uh, got a couple of um, I I had these little mugo pines in here to kind of replicate um, the stunted uh, conifers up in the subalpine. You know the subalpine fir that has the uh, Krumholtz form, the the dwarf form. But they uh, they were a little too happy there, and they ended up getting a, a bit tall. But I have I have a hard time uh, cutting down trees once they're in my yard. So, um, so back to the backyard. Um, some more shots of my wildflower area, um, larkspur and flax, and uh, always bees just love this area, um, and hummingbirds too. Got a little. Uh, water feature for uh, um, basically insects to to drink from birds to really land on it but walk walk around the path love walking around here in the evening um, I have little solar lights in very in places along here and just it's it's like walking through the woods at night just love it and uh, here's the area where my little uh, Bird pond is right here. This is looking back towards the house, and uh, got some. Uh, um, this is a uh, spirea betulifolia. It's a uh, it's a subalpine form of spirea, and uh, subalpine fescue in here. I had this also designed as uh, kind of a subalpine type meadow area. Um, now I'll get in some of my my favorite plants that I have included in this area. Um, the shrub step area have, uh, uh, of course, your big sagebrush and uh, um, pale evening primrose. And uh, I used to have this used to be um, in my front yard. It's uh, gray spinosta, spiny hop sage, and it was doing really well. You could see it flowered here. But then uh, uh, one year it just it just didn't come back, um, and I'm I don't know why. And I haven't replanted that species. Um, I also have uh, uh, for the shrub step species. I also have um, gray rabbit brush, and uh, I have uh, bitter brush, and just wonderful globe mallow. It's globe mallow is just a rock star in the native plant landscape. Um, it it takes no water. It grows pretty much anywhere, and uh, flowers for a good part of the summer. Uh, this is actually out. Th this is the sidewalk, the edge of the sidewalk. The only problem is that uh, uh, I tend to 
have to go along once or twice a year and clip this back. Um, it's the only thing I've ever been cited by the city of Richland for is um, having, uh, having the plants grow too far out into the sidewalk. Fortunately, I, I, I don't know that this type of landscape would be allowed in the other two Tri-Cities, but fortunately Richland has a pretty liberal policy um, for what you plant in your yard. Um, uh, favorite grasses that, like I said, the needle and thread, just, it's just stunning when it's, for most of the year, you know, even after the, even after the awns dry out, it's just beautiful. Uh, Indian rice grass, um, love that too. Um, seems to do pretty well. Um, I used to grow, and you can see a little bit here, um, the bottle brush squirrel tail. Found it to be really messy, and uh, um, the awns would just, would when they dry up, would just break apart, and I'd, they'd be all over the yard, even in my vegetable garden. And uh, so I no longer have that in my yard. I also have uh, Idaho fescue out front, which is formed in some, in areas where it gets enough water, uh, it's a pretty nice, almost kind of lawn-like area. Um, yeah, penstemons. I love penstemons. Um, they are just fabulous to have in even a regular garden, not even not even a, a dedicated native plant garden, just um, a regular uh, landscape. Um, we got uh, speciosis, a showy penstemon, firecracker penstemon, um, paper leaf penstemon, and uh, shrubby penstemon. And the buckwheats, I, the other group, I, probably my second favorite to the penstemons are the buckwheats. Um, just interesting plant forms, um, very durable, very hardy. Um, go in, you know, the different species go into different areas uh, very well, a different uh, habitat types, I mean. Um, got your heart leaf buckwheat here, the more of the shrub step type area. Um, the uh, cushion buckwheat in like the rock garden area and uh, um, uh, sulfur buckwheat goes in either the, the uh, shrub step or the mon more montane areas. And this beauty. Um, I don't know if I have um, polyacantha or fragilis. I've not actually keyed this out. Um, the only reason I think it might be fragilis is it, it is quite fragile. Um, these, the pads break off extremely easily, um, but, uh, what, regardless, I just love having it in the landscape. I want to be careful with this if you have um, kids or dogs. My cat doesn't go near it, but uh, I could see a, a curious dog um, getting in trouble with this. And the various beauties of the Asteraceae genus family. Got Gallardia here. and. Uh, Balsamoriza, uh, Carriana balsam root. Um, I had this growing for a while, and like just like the spiny hop sage, it went on for three or four years. I think it actually receded once, and then uh, and then it just disappeared one year, and I haven't planted it again. But this Gallardia is is very reliable. Reseeds, um, reseeds itself, uh, just. A great plant to have, you know, flowers through the summer. Um, got your little uh, woolly sunflower, um, beautiful little spring fl flowering uh, shrub step plant, and the uh, line leaf daisy, um, another local native. It's just, just lovely. I, 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 uh, the, I, I love these native, the local native wildflowers, but they they have such a short bloom time that's the one drawback for um doing a totally uh shrub step native plant landscape is there there aren't many that are going to keep flowering in the hot months of summer um, 
So that's something that I've had to explain to people who want flowers in their in their uh, shrub step landscape all the time. Um, getting into some shrubs, the currants. This is the dryland um, species, wax currant. You can find it in riparian area, zones in our area. And uh, this beauty, um, golden currant, uh, and uh, uh, red currant, which is more of a west side species. Um, beautiful to have in the landscape in the spring. And, and the, for the berries, for the birds. Um, the more what I call uh, well-behaved shrubs, meaning that they, uh, they stay where you plant them. Um, they don't send out runners or suckers or re even reseed or um, this is uh, service berry. Um, my, I have two service berries and uh, get just a couple gallon Ziploc bags of berries off of them, um, which are great in smoothies or pancakes. Um, and I still have plenty left over for the different species of birds that come and uh, eat off them during the fall and winter. Um, one year I had an <laughs> uh, entire flock of cedar waxwings showed up um, and basically cleaned off uh, uh, the shrubs um, in the fall. Uh, Douglas hawthorn, very attractive, smaller tree. Um, and uh, of course my vine maple. Just, I love these, the bees, these are the, the flowers in the spring, the bees and the hummingbirds love them. These are ones that I, that uh, they are wonderful additions to the landscape in terms of their appearance and what they offer to um, birds and pollinators, um, but they are unruly. <laughs> uh, smooth sumac. Um, sends out suckers everywhere, and so does this guy, uh, choke cherry. Um, you might, if you're going to include either of these, you might want to install a root barrier, such as uh, they sell uh, for bamboo um, at the time of planting, um, especially for the choke cherry. Uh, I this is the one shrub I have, and um, I got so tired of having to pull it up, you know, just multiple stems in my uh, flower bed area um, that I went and, and installed a root berry around it just early this year. And I hope it lives. I had to cut through uh, a couple of pretty substantial roots. Um, it was not the ideal time to do that. I should have done it at time of planting, but I didn't. Uh, I didn't do enough research to find out that it had that tendency. Um, red twig dogwood, just a great screening plant and uh, attractive in the winter, but you just want to make sure that you keep the lower branches trimmed up because it will form new shrubs um, where branches touch the ground. They'll, they will take root. And uh, kind of the same thing for uh, um, uh, Oregon, uh, Oregon grape. Um, sends out underground runners and be, can be kind of invasive, but not anywhere to the degree that these two are. Oh, going on into more, this is my uh, lodgepole pine. Just fascinating flower structure this spring. I've never actually seen that, um, these structures before. Um, and red columbine, galium. Um, got a little western anemone, the first thing to flower in the yard. Everything else is bare and bleak, and this little guy is just starting out. Um, alum root and uh, uh, showy daisy, original speciosis. So, finishing up with some rosea pussy toes here. Um, it's, in conclusion, I just I hope that you find some inspiration in this. And even if you look at, you're looking at your house at, you know, a flat yard with lawn and, you know, no features, um, there are a multitude of possibilities available 
to incorporate uh, native plants and native habitats in your yard. So I will take any questions. Beautiful, Tracy. That was very, very inspiring because I know many of us uh, have started with exactly what you started with <laughs> or have exactly what you have started with. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, absolutely. So does anyone have any questions? If so, you can type those into the questions box. Yeah, there are a oh, good. few questions. Right. Yeah, I, I just want to comment. I never knew that bitter brush and globe mallow was such an amazing combination. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, okay, you have done an awesome transition. How have your neighbors taken to the new look? They were initially very skeptical, and this is this is it's you know part of it. Part of it is having a at least friendly relationship with your neighbors. You know, um, you definitely wanted to talk to them and and kind of give them a heads up about what you're planning on doing. Um, there will still be some shock, um, but I've not had any complaints from my immediate neighbors. Um, they, uh, I think they kind of. They 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 definitely think I'm a little bit of an oddball, but uh, I do think they appreciate um, the birds that I bring to the neighborhood. You know that that my yard has brought to the neighborhood um, different kinds that you didn't used to see here, um, and the fact that I I do keep it up. It's not like it's just um, it's it's not like it's a vagrant property. Um, I get out there, I, I, I deadhead, I deadhead sagebrush, I deadhead the other flowers, keep the leaves cleaned out, um, keep it looking, you know, fairly tidy. Um, and uh, so it's, it's, it's not like it's an abandoned lot. Um, and I, th I think my neighbors appreciate that. Um, and I have gotten people that you know, you know, walking through the neighborhood or driving by that that stop and say, oh, you, you really love it. So. Great. Nice. Getting a lot of comments here. Very beautiful, very inspirational. Thanking you for your presentation. And then we have another question here. How tall does the lodgepole pine get? They can get pretty tall. Um, I expect ours with the water I'm giving it to get probably between 40 and 50 feet tall. Um, in drier, drier areas, um, like where you see a lot of lodgepole pine is, is on the east side um, going up to Mount Hood. And you can see some that are, that are kind of, you know, not getting a lot of water and they're kind of, they're kind of uh, smaller and spindly. Uh, but if you see it in an area where it's getting a lot of water, they can get to be a pretty, pretty large tree. So it really is, it really is dependent on, on how much water you give them. Okay, great. Um, how do you control, I'm going to probably butcher the, the pronunciation, Gallardia? Control for uh, blanket flower. Are there, oh, yeah. blanket oh. flower. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> I cheated. How do, how do I control it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's what this question is asking. Oh, um, if it's growing someplace I don't want it, I pull it up. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It, it is um, a little bit yeah, of a, it, 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 it can be it, a prolific reseeder, can't it? it? Can I mean, a little bit. Yes, it can be a prolific reseeder. Um, yeah, if I, you know, I have, I have quite a few things growing in the yard that are turned out to be prolific reseeders. And my policy is, is if it looks good there, um, I leave it. If it doesn't, I pull it up and I either try and plant it somewhere else um, or uh, compost it. Because um, I have, you know, things have reseeded in places where I didn't initially intend them to be. Like you might see, um, it's like the, the 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 needle and thread grass growing in what I consider to be like the montane area. I mean, you don't see that species growing up in the uh, uh, pine lands of the east slopes of the Cascades, but um, 
it ended up there in my yard and I liked the way it looked in some places and so I left it. So yeah, it's just you, there's going to be there's going to be movement. The plants are going to going to work their way around and it's just a matter of keeping up with how you want it to look. Right. Um, do you have trouble keeping the vine maple and higher elevation plants alive? I have trouble with the uh, uh, vine maple um, is in an area that gets uh, regular irrigation, like deep watering twice a week. Um, and I don't have trouble with the lower part of the plant, but the upper uh, the upper ends of the of the stems, like the the topmost, I'd say, uh, eight six to eight inches of the stems, will get burnt once we've had a few of those hundred degree days in August. They won't die, but the leaves will actually look burnt. Um, but the rest of the tree is fine. Um, so yeah, they they will you know if you give them enough water, they will do well. They will do well here, but the heat can scorch um, uh, the uh, the ends of the branches. I don't know how well they would do in because my yard is fairly sheltered. I mean, I'm in Central Richland, and so I'm not out. My my house isn't on the edge of town. We're on the you know one of one of the slope neighborhoods around here that just get blasted by our winds. I don't know how these. Um, west side or more mesic climate species would do if I uh, in a yard in, in those really exposed locations. Um, there's an alternative to vine maple that is native to eastern Washington and that's Douglas maple. Um, I didn't plant it because I it does not have the the uh, sprawling um, shape of the vine maple that I really found attractive. But if you wanted a more durable, small, you know, sub sub tree uh, maple that's native, Douglas maple is a better choice. Great. A uh, question here about your vegetable garden. Why do you use raised beds? Um, just easier to work in. Um, I. Uh, uh, I have back problems, and so I just found that having the plants up a little bit higher um, to get in there and weed and, and uh, harvest and all that, um, and sit on a little bench or a little stool and get in there and work at them. Um, plus, it just it, to me, it just looks tidier. Um, and uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. I don't I don't know that it's necessarily superior from a growing standpoint. I think my my uh, uh, plants did just as well um, when they were straight in the ground and as uh, in the raised beds. It's more, it's more of an aesthetic thing. Okay. Another question here. Did you have to battle Bermuda grass? Is it okay to let it go and incorporate it? Oh my God. I'm glad somebody brought that up. I, I, <laughs> I think I blocked that out because it was, it's an <laughs> ongoing, nightmare um, yes our initial lawn was mostly Bermuda grass um, and it has been eradicated from the backyard um, did a better job about uh, digging out the turf back there um, and and basically dug out the turf and a lot of it went into the berm upside down um, with dirt and other things piled on top of it because out front, I used some of the dug up uh, Bermuda grass um, layers in a berm out front, but it wasn't, I didn't, and it was turned upside down, roots up, you know, in the, in the hope that it would kill it. But that species is so tough. Uh, it wasn't very deeply enough. And still, I still, I still have uh, an ongoing issue with Bermuda grass a little bit out in the front yard where, in, in areas where, um, I'm supplying some some water to the plants. Great. We've still got a lot of questions here. What do you think, Heather? 
A few um, more? I think there's a, yeah, a few more. I think there's an overarching theme about watering and also mm. about um, did you do any soil amendments for your different uh, zones? So if you could talk um, a little bit about watering and yeah. soil. Yeah, I'll do the soil amendment one first. The only way, the only place um, that I amended the soil that's present is back to that part where I had the uh, the cedar and the huckleberry bushes. I actually added um, soil acidifier there. Um, in the uh, at the end of the berm, the southern end of the berm, where um, I have most of the the rock garden, the and it's total xeriscape, no water. Um, I added gravel and sand um, into the soil there so that the plants that are adapted to grow in that type of climate, um, they also like to have very well drained soil. So um, I did I did amend the soil with, uh, with sand and gravel um, in areas where I was gonna be planting things that required good drainage because the the native the native soil in my backyard is this almost kind of clayish um clayey river sediment type stuff um not very well drained and for the water um everything's that gets water is supplied by uh drip irrigation line um i have different zones a yard on different schedules um, and there are certain places in the yard, both front and back, that get no water whatsoever. Um, so ha ha it, the nice thing about drip irrigation is you can you can have different watering regimes um, in throughout your landscape to enable you to grow um, different native species that have different water needs. Right, and does your drip irrigation also fill up your um, your bird water watering? It does. Uh, yeah, perfect. It does. Yeah, that's an area uh, where the where the little bird water uh, pond is um, is in the part of the backyard that actually gets the most irrigation. Um, I have I have some wetland grasses there, and those uh, the bio pines by Rhea and the vine maples nearby. Um, so yeah, that that gets that gets water twice a week, and there's a little line that goes in to refill the the uh, bird the bird pond. Very nice. And so, if there's someone out there today who wants to get a hold of you, Tracy, and maybe uh, utilize your services, or they have some additional questions, how can what's the best way to reach you? Uh, it's my email address still up on the the screen. Yes, I think it is. It is. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep, they can email me at info at ecosystem aesthetics and I'd be happy to answer the questions. Very nice. Well, that was a phenomenal presentation. Thank you so much, Tracy. We really appreciate your time today. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. And folks, just a reminder that this webinar has been recorded. Um, we will uh, do some editing out of some dead space <laughs> and get that ready uh, and uh, get that out to folks next week. So if you were on this webinar, we have your email address. We will uh, send that out to you directly so you can uh, rewatch uh, this at your leisure. And uh, if you registered or if you know people that registered that weren't able to attend, please tell them not to worry. Uh, we'll make uh, the webinar available for them as well. Um, or any of your friends. We'll put that on our, our website and, and Facebook pages so you can be sure to share that with other folks. Again, I want to thank all of our presenters today. Um, wonderful presentations. Thank you all for being so patient during uh, this lovely COVID time of ours. Uh, we would prefer to meet with you in person, uh, but this I think is, is the next best thing. And again, thank you to Alyssa Carlson and the Washington State Conservation Commission for helping us to host uh, this webinar. Um, with that, Ms. Alyssa, do you have any final words? Um, no, just a big round of applause Yay! for yes. everyone, Yay! all the presenters and panelists, and thank you everyone for joining. This is a great way to spend a um, cold Saturday morning. Absolutely. Anne, any final thoughts? Inspired. Just want to thank everyone for 
participating and great questions today. And uh, just, uh, it was, I just learned so much from every presenter. It was awesome. Thank you very much, everyone. Yes, thank you. And reminder, please feel free to reach out to Ann or myself if you're interested in Heritage Gardens in Benton, Franklin, or Yakima counties. We're here to answer your questions as well. All right. Well, with that, folks, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your weekend, and uh, we'll see you in the garden soon. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Thanks thank a you. lot. Thanks, you guys. Bye, Bye now. Bye.